Okay, welcome to the Saratoga Springs Planning Commission Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. Um, I need to read a brief statement before we start. I, Troy Cunningham, Planning Commission Chair, hereby determined that conducting the Planning Commission meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. The World Health Organization, the President of the United States, the Governor of Utah, and the County Health Department have all recognized a global pandemic exists related to the new strain of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Due to this state of emergency caused by the global pandemic, I find that conducting a meeting at an anchor location under the current state of public health emergency constitutes a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the location. This written declaration expires 30 days from the day signed. Signed Troy Cunningham, Saratoga Springs Planning Commission Chair, dated October 15th, 2020. All right, I'm gonna start off with a Pledge of Allegiance and Bryce McConkie has offered to do that for us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, next is roll call. Um, I believe everyone is in attendance, except for um, Bryce Anderson. I did not see him. Uh, we have a um, quorum present. The first item is a business item site plan for Dominion Energy Station located west of Harbor Parkway. Kevin Mulvey is the applicant, and I believe that'll be presented by Rachel Day. So Rachel, go ahead and take, take over. Thank you, Commissioner Cunningham. So I have opened the presentation. Um, we do have applicants in the meeting tonight as well. So they are here for any questions that you may have. It's pretty straightforward site plan application for utility and, and it's going to serve a lot of future development in the city. So it's west of Harbor Parkway, way west of Harbor Parkway. And there are just a sp couple specific things in their site plan request. One is the site plan itself. And then two, they are requesting that the fencing be a total of seven feet in height around the entirety of the property. So this is an example of the fencing, six feet tall with a about a foot of barbed wire on top. You're going to um, I, sorry, was someone asking something? I heard something. No, no just some participants that I had to mute. Oh, okay. Um, so they're requesting fencing all the way around as it is a utility site. And then here are the elevations as was included in the packet, following code requirements with colors and size. These buildings in the picture, they're just an example. They're actually larger than the ones that are coming to our site, but they just show the materials pretty well. And it's recommended to approve it. I should also add, they have already recorded the subdivision exception for the parcel creation. And there are there is progress in regards to the fifth condition regarding completing a frontage and landscape requirement agreement. Uh, the legal department has been working with Dominion Energy on that. And it's just so that when Harbor Parkway eventually is built out towards the site, that they will be responsible for the frontage and landscaping at that time. And otherwise, aside from approval, you can also continue it or deny the application. Thank you. That's all if there's any questions or anything. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Does the applicant want to add anything? Yeah, hey, uh, this is Chris Balling. I don't know if you can see me. I'm with Dominion Energy in the right-of-way department. Um, we did, uh, Kevin Mulvey cannot be to the night's meeting. We actually subcontract out to have Kevin help us out, but I am oversee what he does. And um, he just sent me an email from Kevin Thurman 
saying that he approved the self-bond agreement and all we need to do is sign it before we start construction. And so that's our plan is to have that signed tomorrow and we start construction tomorrow if we get approval. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and turn this over to the Planning Commission. Um, Commissioner Kildore, I usually start with you, so I'll let you start. Start us off if you have any questions. Yes, thank you. Um, we don't have to always go with me first, but um, just follow whatever um, Commissioner Cunningham goes with. So um, actually, I do have a, a few questions here. See, for the, um, the, I'm sorry, I probably missed, missed it what I was looking for the uh, the application on my on my uh, iPad, but um, we talked about uh, you talked briefly about the height exception for the fence, and I was just wondering um, if you had if you hadn't already said it. I apologize if you have to repeat yourself, but um, just wondering what. Uh, oh yeah, for, uh, for so for for fencing, what's the basis for the height exception? Uh, so basically, why why is this needed and I think I know what it looks like because you showed the picture. So you, I do know what it looks like, um, but why is this needed? And what's the precedence for something like this, for the exceptions for something like this? So it's needed because it's in our code that anything above six feet needs to be approved by the planning commission in the site plan approval process. And so they're requesting seven feet, the fence itself being six. And then, um, I mean, as long as I'm looking at it correctly, it's it has some barbed wire on top as well to make it a total of, of seven feet. They originally were looking at eight feet, but you can't build that tall in a PUE area, but seven feet they can. So that's why it comes before the planning commission at seven feet. Okay. So oh, and I should add to that, sorry, um, okay. that typically front properties don't allow for anything above three feet. And so this, they want it to go around the entire property as it is a utility. Okay. Yeah. So I understand why we have to, why, why the exception has to be requested because it's, it's not what the code says. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, is the code up to date with current, you know, with, with current trends or such? Cause, um, if six feet is not enough to add a barbed wire top to the to a six foot fence then should our code say six feet i guess that's something for our future but i just wanted to bring that up because um i mean i i could see why the applicant wants to have a seven foot fence although i'm not really sure because why not a six foot fence but you know if you've got that barbed wire on top as well then i could see why that's a seven foot fence in which case then i wonder if the code is even up to date you know if it needs to be revised for something like that yeah, if I could jump in here <clears throat> uh, real quick. Uh, actually, barbed wire is not permitted. That's what I thought. For this yeah. you, you can use it in certain instances, not in this case. So they would have to to, to forego the barbed wire. The okay. seven foot obviously is, is a security issue. Um, and so with the barbed wire, but since the code doesn't allow that. Um, the, the, the seven foot, obviously, it's a utility site. There's a there's a element of security involved. Um, six foot fences are obviously shorter than seven. Seven's more difficult to get into. And now you could have a 10 foot fence and someone would still be able to get into over a 10 foot fence. But yeah. just the perception that you're six or seven, seven's obviously a greater safety uh, element than six. And as Rachel pointed out, you as the, the land use authority, the code says that you are the one to uh, approve any fence greater than six. Yeah, so I guess I'd be okay with an exception um, but then maybe something that we do, you know, look back or look at in the future, if maybe six foot is appropriate, if we're going to always have to do exceptions. But I did, I, that was my next question was, I thought barbed wire was not allowed. So in that case, is that another exception that's being requested? Because I didn't see that in the, in the Yeah, it, unfortunately, you can't request barbed wire as an exception. Uh, the only time barbed wire uh, is used, I'll just read, read the code to you here. Um, but no barbed wire, uh, razor wire, chain link, um, whatever maybe shall be allowed. And now unless we've got a section, I'll have to check the utility code. Uh, perhaps we uh, did, did amend that in the utility code, don't recall, where you could use barbed wire. 
Um, this does not apply to chain link or wire fence if the fence one is not being used to delineate lot boundaries and is being used for agricultural uses or otherwise for the keeping of animals and does not occupy more than 50% or is for backstop, sports field, sport court fencing within a public or private park. So I will look up the, see if we had any exceptions under the utility code. Okay. So then if, assuming that there are no exceptions, um, then what would the applicant, you know, is the applicant, I mean, how does the applicant feel about not being able to have a, a barbed wire there? Is that something that's going to be a problem or are you going to have to ask for a higher fence or I mean, what, what, what do you think? So this is Chris Fallon again. Um, Chad DeMille, our engineer on this site is on the line as well. Maybe he could speak to that. Yeah, I, so I, I don't think we'd want to change what we're proposing. Uh, this facility is kind of a major facility in the area uh, and we definitely want to secure it as best we can. We feel like the, the fence height is adequate. Uh, we've already lowered it to, to try and, and meet that property setback. I do want to note that this isn't on the, it's not delineating property lines. This has a setback of three feet from the back and side property lines, as well as a 25 foot setback from the front property line. And it is securing the area that we will need to keep people out of. So, I mean, the, the whole front area is, is still going to be open. And do you mind if I ask a question? Are you there? Um, yeah. My question, if, if it's okay, is what security issues or hazards are inside that, that would need the barbed wire? So this facility is a pressure regulation facility. There's gonna be valve pipes and valving where we do not want anyone who doesn't know what's going on with it, turning valves. You could potentially have someone going out there turning a valve and and overpressurizing the entire IHP or lower pressure system that this feeds into, which would, I mean, we just had one not a year and a half ago where homes that had overpressurization events blew, uh, literally blew up. And uh, luckily there was only one death. It wasn't in our company, but it was back East. And so we definitely need to keep anyone who is not authorized out of this facility. Uh, the other option is they might shut a valve that's critical to keeping service to all the, the residents here. And, and I, I can show you that um, if, if this facility is, is compromised or is shut off for any reason, unknowingly, uh, thousands of homes will be without gas service. And if that happens in the wintertime, you can imagine the problem that would be. Thank you. I, Thank you. Can I add something? I, I did find the section relating to barbed wire. So it says in, this is regarding public utility um, facilities or sites. And it says notwithstanding fence requirements contained in chapter 19.06, barbed wire may be used in conjunction with a chain link fence if warranted because of a legitimate security concern related to the health, safety or general welfare of the public. Okay. Where, so that, that, I didn't see that. That was in the utility section. I guess I just didn't read far enough. Yeah, it's, um, it, it originally came from the conditional use permit section, but all of that was moved over to the supplement. Oh yeah, okay, that's right. Uh, yeah, because I remember the discussion that we had when we reviewed that bit of code on the barbed wire. And I remember saying, I remember, I think, yeah, I think I remember that the conclusion was that there wasn't any allowed, but you're right in the, con in the conditional section, but then that was later moved. So that's probably why I didn't even think about that. I might have, okay, well, that's good because then that, that's not a problem then. Um, okay, so yeah. Um, another question I have, if, if I could continue then is, um, Oh, under the uh, for landscaping, there are a lot of can complies. And I was wondering, was that because of the road and utility work? So before the road and utility work is done, I guess you really can't uh, can't uh, solidify the landscaping plans. Is that is that right? I think 
landscaping. Yes, that's correct. And they do follow landscaping requirements for interior of the fence, this which is, like is they don't really have to have it except for the barrier. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, Commissioner Kilgore, for just jump. Yeah. If you recall, we had a uh, secondary water pond up in uh, Wildflower probably, I don't know, a year ago. Uh, the same situation. The roads are waiting yet, the water wasn't in there yet. So when the time right. comes, water and whatnot are, are up there, then we'll have uh, the city will actually go in, I believe, unless it's going to be changed in the agreement. Uh, just we'll, we'll go plant some trees or the or the utility will go plant some trees. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think on page nine, there's another can comply there. The agreement to ensure that all frontage requirements are installed when the road comes through. So I guess uh, that's also be because um, uh, there's no agreement yet. Or, um, or, well, is it is it because there's no agreement or is it an issue with the future road uh, for that uncertainty there? It's just what's within the agreement. Okay, all right. Okay, and then uh, because this is administrative action, decision i'd like to ask the applicant if you would be uh if you are willing to comply with all the conditions in the um, city staff packet yeah i think we've reviewed all those conditions and i think we're acceptable on all those okay i think uh, that's it for me thank you okay thank you commissioner kilgore i'll just go down the list here Commissioner Barton, do you have any comments or questions you'd like to ask? I don't, Ken always gets to them for me. So I appreciate that. <laughs> so I don't okay. have anything else. Thank you. Else. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bryce McConkey, do you have anything? Any questions or anything you'd like to add? Okay, I'll go on to Commissioner Ryan. Reed Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to add or questions? I, I think uh, most of them are covered by Commissioner Kilgore. I did have a question, and I'm guessing we're doing this as a realization of cost savings and convenience savings as we build the city. Uh, do we have an idea, Rachel, on when anticipated build out is to this location so that these, this agreement will be fulfilled with a can complies in terms of the landscaping and otherwise? No, I don't know of when that would happen. And then I think you had mentioned it, but I didn't catch the tail end of it. You had mentioned the the lawyers or legal for a city has looked it over and are comfortable with it. Is that correct? I just wanted to confirm that. Yes, I was CC'd on that email from Kevin. Excellent. Thanks. That's, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Commissioner Wagner, do you have any questions or comments you'd like to ask? I don't. Um, thanks for the clarification on the barbed wire, though. That's good to know. I didn't know that either. So that's everything. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, so I don't have any comments um, and anything in addition to what's already been asked. So we'll go ahead and open this up for oh, a moment. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Anderson just joined as well. Oh. And I see Commissioner McConkey's back on. Okay. Com 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 Commissioner Anderson. Yeah, you, sorry. I'm any just questions gonna, you'd like to ask or comments? Uh, I'm not even, I just joined. I'm not even sure uh, I can hang with you right now. I'm just getting up to speed. I apologize for being late. I was stuck in okay. traffic. I thought I can make it at six o'clock if I go to the city hall. And I went to the city <laughs> hall and it was locked. So I got back in my car <laughs> and traffic for another 16 minutes to get home. So here I am. That's my alibi. Okay. Um, Commissioner McConkey, did you have anything you wanted to add or questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, sorry, my uh, brand new laptop glitched out. So <laughs> that's, uh, alibi. that's my alibi. <laughs> um, I did have some questions. Uh, I I did also. I appreciated what Commissioner Kilgore uh, is some questions he had and um, had some question on the fencing as well. And part of it, and also the, the aesthetics on the building, part of it has to do with what the city has uh, anticipates around the building. Um, I'm looking at the 
uh, the example picture, for example, um, of the buildings. And I, I can't say that they're very attractive, which doesn't necessarily concern me a lot unless they're adjacent to an uh, anticipated subdivision, uh, looking at what the, uh, the value and the aesthetics are. Um, and also the fence type chain link versus, uh, for example, what's in the picture, some concrete fencing, which is, um, before I saw the picture, a, a question I had. So, so really in anticipation of the type of development that we're expecting and anticipating around this um, particular lot, what will, um, I guess, best uh, provide the, an ideal setup. Does that make sense? Yeah. My question is. It does. It does. So they do meet all of the minimum standards for the utility structures. They actually did have to change a couple of the fencing details so that it was earth tone and the building detail to increase the pitch of the building, for example, for the roof. Okay. Um, and if it helps too, if you look at the site plan, the area surrounding it is actually the proposed future alignment of Foothill Boulevard on the west. The north is Harbor Parkway, and then it's, I can't think of what road it is to the east, or, and, but nothing will be abutting it. No, no subdivision. And plan. I should add too, with the vinyl, they are well, not really because there'll be roads there first for one. And then um, they are far enough away from any existing residential that they can, they're permitted to use vinyl. Yeah, the, the code, if, if you had residential within 200 feet, they would not be able to do the chain link, vinyl coded chain link. But since so, they're far enough away, in a sense, they're there first. And so whatever builds around it already comes into the, the picture with this site already developed. Okay, so this is a vinyl coated chain link fence. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Yes, and it's dark brown in color. Okay. Okay, I, I can't say that. I, I mean, I, I look at what uh, is on. Uh, in fact, looking on page doesn't have a page number. Two of five. The um, showing the site plan, um, future residential development to the north. Um, maybe we're just stuck with the uh, with the city ordinances, and currently on that one, and that's fine. Um, that answered another question I had. Uh, there was a, in the uh, general review, there's an error on the uh, um, the IFC code reference it says IFC, this is on page six, IFC 2015 and the state currently is adopted the 2018. And I think, so what, what was the height of this building? Or is this one or two buildings? This is one building, correct? Uh, yes, it's just one building. Um, it goes to a maximum height. Sorry, I, I can't read what it says right now. It's not as big as the ones in that presentation I had shown, though. Um, that's good. It actually had to be made slightly taller in order to meet our pitch requirements for one. But I, I'm sorry, I can't tell how tall it is right now. I'd have to pull up another document. Okay, I'm looking on, uh, there's a cross section eight foot eight to the, looks like top of wall. That's not bad. I see, yeah. My computer is not cooperating here again. I, I thought I thought 
it looks like it's 35 feet, isn't it? Oh no, I'm, never mind. That's the regulation. Never mind. So I'm looking on page two of three of the I'm trying to see what. Yeah, it's the same as showing the CMU color and the metal roofing. And it's showing eight foot eight. I, I, I will admit that makes me a little happier. Having worked in uh, other jurisdictions that have, they're, they're certainly not ugly buildings, but they're not, they don't necessarily enhance anything aesthetically. And when things get developed around it, I, what, I feel like it's important to at least consider that, that we're trying to set, set our whole environment up for success without creating some exorbitant cost and unnecessary uh, difficulty for the, the uh, builder and developer. So the chain link fence, I, I'm not a fan of chain link fences personally, but if that's what the city ordinance is allowing, I think that's what we're stuck with. But that's all my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner McConkey. All right, I believe that's everyone. Um, go ahead and entertain a motion. This is Commissioner Ryan. I move to approve the proposed site plan for Dominion Energy Station located west of Harbor Parkway with the finding conditions and the staff report dated October 22nd, 2020. I have a motion from Commissioner Ryan. Second. Second from Commissioner Wagstaff. Any question on the motion? We'll go ahead and go through a uh, roll call vote here. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Do you wanna? Yeah, do I say aye or yay? Yes, aye, aye is good. <laughs> Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner McConkey. Aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Commissioner Wagstaff. Aye. And I, I from me, and Commissioner Kilgore. Sorry. Aye. Aye. Okay, that looks unanimous. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item. Congratulations to Dominion Energy on that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, so the next item, uh, business item, is a preliminary plat and site plan for South Saratoga Elementary located approximately Schoonover Drive and Captain Street, Alpine School District says Frank Pulley Jr. is the applicant and Gina Grand Prix is gonna present this for the city. Good evening, commissioners. Um, we have two applications before you this evening with the, from Alpine School District. We have Scott Johnson, who is here representing the school district as well as Nicole Luthi, which is their engineer. So we'll just get right into it. The land use authority for this just to give you some understanding of the two applications that are here. The preliminary plat, they are creating a subdivision for the school site. And so there is a preliminary plat application. And then there is a site plan. So the preliminary plat is the city council land, the city council is the land use authority. So you'll be making a recommendation on the preliminary plat for the city council. And then the site plan is the commission, the planning commission is the land use authority. So the site plan is you will make a final decision on that this evening. Um, the general plan is low density um, residential. And so the zone that overlays that is rural, um, sorry, residential 110. Um, so the address, um, it is south, the very south of the city. So you have um, the, I can show you here, it's, Next to Lighthouse Cove, I don't know if you recall that subdivision, um, but I don't think you've seen an application for that yet. So the site plan or the site for the school is south of um, the subdivision here that I am drawing a blank. I apologize, but um, the very south of the city. So we have the preliminary plot, which is the um, the site for the entire subdivision. There is the school site, which is gonna be on lot one um, here. And so, and then site um, 
lot two or phase two will be the south road and the improvements along the front of Redwood Road. We then have, um, oh, here we go. So we have, I knew that was gonna be that. We have the phasing plan. This is also technically the site plan. They overlaid the phasing plan over the site plan. Um, you have phase two, which is this road here, and then the purple, which is phase one, the, the, which is the site that the school will sit on, as well as the improvements, the public improvements of extending Captain Street and Spooner Drive. And so there is, there is public improvements, therefore the reason for the preliminary plot and the phasing plan. We have the landscaping. Um, just to, to make note, the site plan or the preliminary plot requires landscaping. And so you see the landscaping here. Um, the landscaping we can't necessarily require, you know, govern because it is a school. And so um, just as we just made sure that they had it. We did ask them on this east, on this north side of the school property, there is this island of property that the school owns and then Captain Street will be just south of there. We did ask them to install trees. There was just rock there in the um, in their first in their first submittals. We just wanted to screen that neighborhood to the north. The city is providing a irrigation meter for them so that they can water the landscaping on that side, um, which is great of them to be able to um, work with us on that. So that will provide some screening to the school from the neighboring neighborhood. Um, just to provide the other pieces of the landscaping plan. There is this section parcel A on the preliminary plot. Um, you will see back here on the phasing plan, um, the city engineer, oh, I put in the wrong one, I apologize. Anyways, this um, the city engineer, Jeff Pearson, I believe he is on um, this meeting as well, has asked that there be a connection to Cap, um, Captain Dry Street from Redwood, the trail on Redwood Road. Um, that will provide some connectivity for students that are walking when other neighboring developments occur. So just so you know that there is a, an additional red line and the school district has, um, has added that. So that's just an um, additional insight on that. I'll get back here to, um, so you can see on parcel A down here, there will be a connection from Redwood Road Trail to Captain Street Sidewalk. Um, so with that, the Planning Commission does recommend approval, um, does recommend that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation of approval for the site, for the preliminary plot to the Planning Commission, or to the, sorry, to the City Council. Um, just we added through different conversations, um, Gordon Miner, our city engineer has requested that we add a condition to the, the condition of the preliminary plat to forward to the city council, which is the, um, is number six. So we ask that you include that an improvement bond and impact fees for the public improvements, including those in phase two shall be paid prior to the recordation of any final plat. And so um, we ask that you include that in the conditions this evening. So you will have to add that in your, mo in your motion and um, because it was not included in the staff report. So when, when you are making your motion, we ask that you include that condition. Other than that, um, any discussion or questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. And we'll go to the site plan, sorry. We'll, we'll kind of break this up and then we'll go forward with the site plan. Okay. So. Your suggestion we do this part first and then the site plan second? Yeah, I just okay. to, I, I just think that's a good it. idea. Yeah, just to keep, keep them, them separate. Okay, um, the applicant, um, would they like to add anything to the presentation? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just jump in here as well, just uh, on that red comment, the red comment there for the improvement bonds and impact fees, uh, just wanna make it known that with the, the middle school that was built, we have still yet to receive those fees from the school district. And so uh, hopefully, you know, we'll receive those soon and, and these ones will not be as uh, drawn out and delayed uh, like the middle school. So we need to get those fees paid on for both the schools. 
Okay. Um, would the applicant like to add any any additional comments? No, I we'll work through that. We've got our business administrator working on the, the fees. Hopefully we can work something out quickly. Um, okay. As far as everything else, I think uh, we should be able to comply with, so. All right. Um, I will go ahead and open this up to the Planning Commission. And uh, does it, anyone like to go first? <laughs> And these are just comments based on preliminary plat, not on the site plan. Correct. I do not need to go. Okay. But do you mind distinguishing the two be between the two for sure. me? Sure. So the preliminary plat is the actual recorded site or recorded lot that the school will be built on. Um, mm -hmm. The our land use ordinance requires that that we have a recorded plot in order for them to install public improvements. So they're in they're, they're they need the public improvements in order to move forward with their school because they need those the captain street, they need Schooner Drive in order to access their lot. There is a stub to the property, um, but obviously with the school site, that's not going to be sufficient. So they, they'll need to in, in, they'll need to expand additional system improvements. And so um, with that, they'll need to do a recorded plat in order to dedicate those streets over to the city and in order to get the, the those improvements built correctly with inspections and so forth. So that's the preliminary plat. Now the site plan is different in that we are we will be looking at just what is in what the school is doing on the site plan. And we don't have too much um, too much to say on that because um, school districts are a separate, they are their own public um, jurisdiction. And so um, the state code does restrict municipalities from weighing in on their aesthetics, their landscaping, um, those type of things. But as far as the state code goes, we do, they, the school does, re, the school is required to follow our land use code in making public improvements so they can access the school and have water and sewer and, and all of those improvements. So they still have to follow. We have a certain standard that the that all developers have to follow in order to have those public improvements. And in order for the city to take over on those improvements, they have to have a recorded plat and a dedication plat in order to do that. And so that's the difference between a site plan and a, and a preliminary plat is the Preliminary plat is where those public improvements are are designed, recorded, and, and developed. So, and then the site plan is more of the building that's on the site, the landscaping, and so forth. Oh, and also, Thank you. The preliminary plat um, authority, final authority is the city council, while site plan authority, final authority is the um, planning commission. Correct. Right. Um, sorry, Commissioner McConkie, does that answer your question? It, it, it does. I, I guess I, I'm in my mind, I do have some questions and I'm trying to distinguish which, which one it would fall under. Okay. So if Go there's ahead some... and ask them and I can, we can, we can decipher that. So is that okay, Commissioner Cunningham? Yes, that's fine. Go ahead and ask your questions. Thank you. Um, my questions, uh, really have a lot to do with the impact uh, on the neighbors, okay. uh, especially uh, regarding parking um, and uh, and also uh, going to and coming from school. Uh, I noticed that there's uh, some bike lanes, five foot bi bike lanes included on each side of um, what roads Captain Street. And what was the other, the other street that goes in front of the oh, school? Schooner, Schooner, Schooner Drive. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, with many other schools that I've seen, uh, my concern is really has to do with safety regarding the bike lanes versus those turning into drop-off and pickup zones just by default. 
and wondering if we're setting setting the students and the people up for success uh, on a safety side. And then wondering also for school events um, where, you know, parents come and watch performances during the day or, you know, certain holidays during the year, if there would be a, a negative impact on the neighbors that could pose a bit of a difficulty to the city. So a lot of those impacts there, you know, there is the traffic study I did send to you. Um, a lot of those impacts are weighed out in that traffic study. Um, obviously the school is just as concerned about student safety as the community is. And so, and, and so is the city. So that is why um, the public improvements that we have, that we have here on the preliminary plat, um, need to be done so that they, you know, the striping and all of that that has been proposed gets done so for that safety. And I mean, it, it's like any other school, I believe that, you know, those, their students going to school. I, I believe the school district has their best interests at heart as well. And so I believe the improvements that we, that we have on here and that they have proposed will address all of those safety concerns. Okay, and I, I want to be clear. I certainly don't don't want to sound negative in any way. Certainly, widening the roads will create some uh, more traffic friendly patterns and so forth. Um, there was uh, an elementary school here in the city that uh, the the traffic to and from was uh, very difficult and uh, was a great concern to students. In fact, they did have some accidents. And I guess what my, my thoughts were is uh, if how, how we're dealing with, with that aspect and-, and uh, oh, Absolutely. So yeah. I, think, I think too, something to maybe help, help you understand, there's a lot of growth that is, that is slated for around this elementary school. Not only that, as we have a lot of growth up here in the north, um, Redwood Road, um, that's one of the hangups that the school district has had is working with UDOT because UDOT is looking to widen that road in their future plans. And so they want to make sure that the school district is designing their, their um, connections with their future plans to expand the road. Um, the city administration, Mark Christensen and Owen are looking at trying to get a grant for a pathway to go across Rest Redwood Road to where they wouldn't be crossing Redwood Road at all. They'd be going over, you've probably seen those. Um, that's the desire. I mean, you got, that's an expensive, that's an, ex it, an expensive endeavor. So um, obviously that's gonna be years down the road, but that's what we're all aiming for is to make sure that these students have a safe passage to school. Um, the trail corridor along Redwood Road, we all that will be built to the, the standard that is you see along Redwood Road um, and will provide a safe passage for students there as well, as well as the south, south road here will have, um, you know, the city standard sidewalks and, and so forth for students to travel. So I think the overall plan is, is preparing for some of these future, attack, you know, future amenities that will be able to help protect the students in their approach to school. Gina? This is the part of the phase one is what it is. Gina, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Um, won't the school district until there's a, a, a crossing have to bus um, kids across Redwood Road until there is an adequate crossing? That would be a question for the school district. So mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know, Scott, are you able to answer that question? I believe so, but I'm not 100%. Yeah, I think they're still working through bus routes and school boundaries and, and, and all that, but my thoughts would be that, that they'd be bust at this point. Commissioner McConkie, is that all the all that you have? I think I was just looking through my notes here, and I okay. I I didn't get a chance to look at the uh, the traffic study. I just was sent. Was it yesterday? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that, thank you. Yes. Recently. 
So Gina, was Bryce's question a site plan question or um, preliminary plan? Kind of. <laughs> it's kind of both because the public improvements again, go back to the preliminary plan. And so these public improvements will have sidewalk, curb and gutter. And like you said, there's gonna be bike lanes, there's gonna be three turning lanes. There's the, the traffic study does um, point out some of those aspects. Um, so it's kind of both, you know, we look at those things for a site plan. Um, but again, we go back to state code where we, I mean, yes, it is the safety of the kids. And I believe they've done a good job in providing that. And that's why their city has required them to make sure that this South Road is in as long as well as the frontage improvements along Redwood Road so that they do have a, a safe passage and we ensure that those improvements get put in. So when the citizens have a lot of cars that are parked along the street, what do we tell them as a planning commission? What have you told them before? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, it's. And when I when I say along the street, I'm really I'm really talking about along in in the the uh, subdivision, right? Adjacent subdivision, rather than along these two particular streets, right? And until Lighthouse Cove, they have a concept plan. Um, I sorry, I failed to make mention that Lighthouse Cove is is party to this preliminary plan and will be signing the application because they own um, Schooner Schooner Drive and the South Road. Um, they own center line of the road, and so they do have to sign the plat. Um, they do have a concept drawing on Lighthouse Cove, but there is no preliminary plat, and so. Um, there are some changes that they have to make with the drainage and so forth. So there could be, I, I don't know what, what that subdivision will look like. And with the neighboring school, you know, there may be side streets and so forth. And I maybe Gordon or Jeff may be, or Dave might be able to answer that question a little bit easier. Um, that's yeah. The we, you know, obviously the Lighthouse Cove is in really early stages and with the sewer capacity issues probably won't happen for several years, but um, the, the local street, um, as you know, doesn't have the bike lane, but the collector street cross section does. And so that's, it's basically us choosing between the local and the collector street and the collector street is more conducive to safer traffic conditions and pedestrian conditions there. So that's why we chose that. It, if you want to think about cars parked on a local street versus on a collector street, though, it'll actually be better from a pedestrian standpoint, if that helps. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So in looking at, in, in the traffic study um, that was sent, is that connected to the preliminary plot? Um, both. Okay. Both. We do require a, a traffic, the traffic study for a site plan as well. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thanks. Gina. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner McConkie. Do you have any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Yeah, I do. Um, Commissioner Kilgore, go ahead. Yeah, on the, on, in part A of the executive summary of the staff packet, um, it talks about Redwood Road and south of Captain Lane. So I'm guessing, I don't think there is a Captain Lane. There should be Captain Street. Captain Street. I apologize. Okay. It is Captain yeah, Street. The, yeah. Um, confusion there. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah. So I also didn't have a chance to look at the traffic study because I just saw it this morning. Um, but I'm guessing that all the... Um, principal or, or pertinent um, findings of the traffic study or recommendations of the traffic study are in the conditions of the staff report. Is that right? Yes. And that is, well, under the, yes, because they have been reviewed by our engineer. Okay. So it would fall under that condition that all of the, the requirements of the city engineer are met. Okay, great. Um, and then, um, I want to ask the applicant then is the, since this is an administrative 
action of, would, well, let's see, should I wait for the slide? No, actually, actually it's for both. Um, would, is the applicant willing to comply with the uh, conditions found in the city staff packet, including the engineer report? Yeah, I think we can comply with everything. Like I said, we'll we'll have to work with our business administrator on the bonding and impact fees. Hopefully that will be resolved quickly. Um, it would be nice to get some of these roads started this fall. Um, but I know these conditions are pending. So yeah, I think we can comply with all that. Okay. Yeah, because that was the next thing I was going to ask because since the uh, uh, Director Stroud brought up the fees. I was going to ask, so how do we know that that same problem that occurred before won't happen again? But I guess if it's in the conditions here, then that pretty much limits what can be done before payment. Is that is that right? Before before recordation, so they cannot, they wouldn't be able to record the plot until those bonds are are paid, um, impact fees are paid, and. You know, and, and I believe the school's intention is to have those improvements done. And so, um, you know, it's it's a tiny thing more than anything. So, um, yeah, the, the final recordation of either phase one or two or both plots, phase one and phase two, will be required to be um, paid prior to any final recordation of either of either flat. OK, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kilgore. Do we have any other comments? I just have a quick question for Director Stroud, just about the fees again. Um, so on the middle school, is that not something that we required for them to pay beforehand like we are here? How, why aren't those, I mean, what, what happened there? Uh, the, the, the collection of the fees is handled by the administrative department. I'm, I'm not too up to speed. I just haven't talked to uh, the city manager today about that. Uh, he just wanted to remind uh, and put that out there on notice that the, the, the fees have still yet to be paid for the middle school. That's okay. about all I can give you right now. Okay, thanks. That's all I had. Okay, if there's nothing else, then go ahead and uh, open this up for a motion. We move to recommend approval of the South Saratoga Elementary School preliminary plat with the findings and conditions in the staff packet below. Including number six, you gotta add number six. And <laughs> to add condition number, uh, a condition, um, improvement bond and impact fees for the public improvements, including those in phase two, shall be paid prior to recordation of any final plat. I second that. Okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Kilgore. Do we have a second on motion? Anderson, the second. Okay, Commissioner Anderson with a second. Do we have a question on the motion? Okay, we'll go ahead and go through a roll call again. Commissioner Anderson, yay or nay? Aye. Commissioner Barton? Aye. Commissioner McConkey? Aye. Commissioner Ryan? Aye. Commissioner Wagstaff? Aye. Commissioner Kilgore? Aye. And an I from Commissioner Cunningham. Okay, that item. Congratulations. Oh, we're we're going to stick with this for a minute. Yes, we got one go. more to go for. We have one more to go. So this here is the site plan. This isn't the, well, it, it is the site, the final site plan, except for the additional landscaping and the trail that goes along here. Again, these are regulated by the state. And so we don't have much say on that. We do appreciate the school district um installing some landscaping like trees and so forth on the north um this north parcel because it does help with with screening um other neighborhoods from the use of the school and so really it's it the site plan is pretty pretty simple um i have included the elevations and the materials as required by the code um, but again, we don't, we can't govern their aesthetics or landscaping or anything like that. And so, um, with that, the planning or the staff, with that staff recommends that you, that the planning commission approve the site plan for the South Saratoga Elementary School this evening. Okay, thank you, Gina. Does the applicant want to add anything to the presentation? Nope. 
think so. Okay. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to the Planning Commission for questions. Commissioner McConkie, you look like you're ready to ask a question. In my mind, I'm wondering, is this just a formality because we don't have any say? Yeah, pretty much. We still, they still, again, they still have to follow our land use code to a certain extent. And this is an application that's required by our land use code. And so um, they are, they are required to, to get this. So there's only one vote here. It would, it I would didn't say that. Up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Yep. No questions. Okay. Any other questions from the Planning Commission on this? I have a question. Go ahead, Commissioner Anderson. Until um, COVID is over, I will be suspicious of all traffic reports in perpetuity. So <laughs> I just think the volume, so this thing was dated August 10th, and I don't know if the applicant can speak to that. I just wonder how we accommodate for that um, cause even, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time on the roads, especially in Saratoga Springs. And I know, uh, I feel pretty familiar about how it ebbs and flows, but I'm not uh, in, an engineer when it comes to traffic studies, but I just wonder how we accommodate for that. Especially. Yeah. Commissioner Anderson to that question. I wonder if the data, you know, although it's dated more recently here when it's, uh, the age of COVID, if the data that they're accessing is from prior to, I, I believe in some of the other ones we've seen that that was the case that they had to historically go back into like 2018, 2017 traffic levels to kind of understand, but maybe so. No, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to see this one, but I, I do think that's, it, it's a great point. And I just wonder, I'm not quite sure on this report. Well, well Commissioner Anderson brought up a good point a couple meetings ago about we have since 1718 we have Costco we have the temple coming in we have other things coming in so even those reports probably aren't as accurate as we need to see right I mean that was I know you brought that up before yeah the other thing is is I, I traffic varies by season right so certain roads get busier come fall and spring and then winter obviously you have more parents driving kids versus them taking their scooters or motorized whatevers. And so I just, um, that doesn't need to be answered now to, to get the, the motion that we need. I just, I'd love to be educated more on these traffic studies because I, I think, man, I could make a, a pretty, I could do a bang up job on a traffic study too, but it doesn't mean it's, I don't know. I just, I'm suspicious. That's all. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, this is uh, Gordon Miner. Um, if you have any questions, you're, or any of the commissioners for that matter, uh, feel free to drop by my office. Uh, well, I guess uh, COVID times. Uh, contact me and uh, we'll work through any of those. So uh, just let me know. Um, Gordon is really good at answering emails or questions that you have because I've asked him a couple of good ones and uh, he's done a good job. And one of them I asked him about, he even sent me videos. <laughs> yeah, so it's my pleasure. And it's a good point. Uh, you know, we probably aren't seeing as many uh, vehicles out on the streets right now. It, uh, in this particular site, it's more about uh, trip generation from the site than it is about the capacity of the streets around it. And so the, the road that's going to be built to the south that connects to Redwood Road, um, that's going to mitigate any of the circulation concerns around the, around the site. It, it does appear also that we're talking the very far south end of the city and there's not much traffic that comes from the south, correct? Right, and so as far as COVID's concerned, down in that neck of the woods, um, you know, it's probably not changed much. But like I say, uh, the system has capacity down there. This traffic study really is about uh, just generation from the site and, and dealing with the the uh, ins and outs of the site. But do I, I assume they take comparable, like in a place that's yet to be more developed, they're, they're taking it from a, a comparable. <laughs> in yeah, exactly. You're totally sure. 
Yeah. All right, let's go. Bully in games doesn't usually come up and try to steal the ball from you. Yeah, that's right. Oh, something happened to Gordon's video. <laughs> um, so I just oh. want to point out real quick as well that um, even though we can't govern a lot of what the dist- what the no. district does when they we build our the schools, yeah. they really do a great job and they are all usually willing to put, you know, the landscaping always looks nice, the schools always look nice. I know, like you said, I mean, we don't have a lot of say in what they do with that, but um, I appreciate the fact that they actually, I mean, they, they make it look nice. So I Tired, yeah. something to point out as Thursday. well. Yeah. You're right, Commissioner Barton. I appreciate that. I find it just a little humorous. It's I use that I, I, I fully agree. Even when I'm like running really fast, I use that strategy in yeah, short Yes. I don't like know who is not muted. This uh, line it, it's to not another line. Uh-huh. And they're the really Oliver. far apart. You gotta run really hard to get <laughs> past the sharks right. and into the good zone. But if they David kick Johnson, the ball you out, then you lose. People. You're so, a shark. So you? Yes, hold so on. You go really fast, and then what do you do? Huh? You just uh, real fast, and then you get in, or what are you doing? Oh, so we, like, run to <laughs> a line to line. Best part of the right. meeting. But how did you kick the goal in? Like, how did you, what, what did you do again? I oh, don't even so we did it just... All right. I I have to say Oliver was the most entertaining part so far. No. <laughs> okay. So did did we get all our questions answered? Asked? I got them asked and I know um Gordon has all the answers and I will take those to him. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Anderson. You know right. go ahead. Who was somebody had a question? Sorry. All right. Okay. Sorry, I wanted to ask something. Um, so Go ahead, Commissioner Kilgore. In line with what uh, Commissioner Anderson asked, but not, necess- but not necessarily pertain to this application. But um, so, with those traffic studies, you know, that were done, and maybe the data was collected 2018, 2019. Um, we t- we say that they have to. Be, they're probably out of date because it doesn't take into account Costco or. Um, I mean, for me, I think those two hospitals that are coming in, that, you know, that's another one. But, but we knew that those were going to come in years ago. So I'm wondering, you know, Gordon, um, were, are, are, were those large uh, big box retailers accounted for or, you know, anticipated for as much as possible back in those uh, data collecting days in 2018, 2019, as well as, you know, projections into 2050? At least in the previous traffic studies that we've seen, as well as like the current one, do they do they already anticipate those kinds of things, like like the two hospitals that we're going to get, or the or the temple? Are you talking about the traffic study for this this school? Um, well, so I'm, like like I said, it's more pertaining. It's along the lines of what Commissioner Anderson was asking, but also this came up last uh, meeting, and then and then we have a traffic you know report in front of us, and so if we're su- if we're suspect because it if it's using data before COVID, but d- doesn't the data or the projections projections before COVID already include big box retailers like Costco, as well as the Temple, as well as the two hospitals that are coming in? Doesn't that already include all that, or it or it doesn't? As far as projections go, well, each site each site uh, studies the system. Uh, the way it is at the time, it doesn't, it's, uh, each study doesn't take into account future development. No, it doesn't. Okay, so I thought the plan, okay, so I could see that with the traffic study. Are you plan, talking about the transportation master plan? Yeah, so, well, I would think that the traffic studies would rely on some of the information in the master plan, and the master plan does take into effect those, or does anticipate those larger developments that we know about or are anticipating right so or or does the traffic study is it are the these individual traffic studies completely independent of the traffic of the of the master plan so there's there's what they call the regional transportation model yeah and that's that's a model that is um, uh, generated by the mountainland association of governments and 
that that model uh, looks at projected traffic uh, uh, and future land use for uh, the entire region. You know, all of North Utah County, and and it's it's a very regional perspective. Um, our transportation master plan is based on that model, and so when. Uh, but that model only looks at uh, major facilities, you know, arterials, Redwood Road, Pony, uh, Pioneer Crossing. And it doesn't go down into granularity of, of uh, the every collector street within the city. And then as applications come along, uh, they will, they will look at that model. They'll take some information from that model, but they're mostly looking at uh, impacts that their site would have on the immediate vicinity of their site. Does that answer your question? Yeah, because if that is the case, then that means traffic studies won't take into account Costco's or or the, the hospitals or the temple, unless the project is right in that area then, is that right? Right, and, and it won't, uh, yeah, because these, these studies are about, you have to remember, these studies are about their impact to the system. So um, it, it's about what's going on in the system when they come and, and what impact they're going to have on the system as they, as they get underway. Okay. That that's the purpose of these studies. They're they're not more global than that. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Sure. Okay. Can I um, ask one more question to follow? Yeah, up? go ahead. Is that okay? On uh, Commissioner Kilgore's question, it raises a question um, with the the capacity of the schools uh, 700 to was it 850 or something like that i'm looking right. for it here there on page roman numeral two i believe mm -hmm. um knowing that uh schools typically don't get built until they're bursting at the seams what is 850 the maximum capacity? Or are we looking at a potential of uh, 1,200 students before we find some relief for this school if, if we're looking at other schools as an example? And if so, how is that going to affect traffic patterns? And So I, I would invite the applicant to... Uh, address these questions. Sorry, I missed some of that. So, can you kind of summarize that again? We're we're looking, Scott, at the uh, the capacity of the school is uh, says uh, between seven hundred and eight hundred and fifty, and looking at other schools as an example, um, and the over uh, exceeding the, the capacity up to 1,200 and more. Um, what, I, I guess, really my question is with the, the traffic study, and again, have, haven't had a chance to really look at it, if, um, are we able to accommodate the additional traffic and still maintain some decent traffic flow and some safety be uh, above 850 students or if we're right there on the line or what we're looking at there. So maybe, um, uh, Scorton again, uh, would it help if I try to interpret your, interpret your question? Uh, sure. The, the way I interpret your question is, um, will, when this school is at capacity, will it cause congestion uh, in the public streets around the school. Is that a good interpreta interpretation of your question? 
it's it's a good interpretation with addition and looking at other elementary schools in the area and they've had uh you know the trailer classrooms um, and created some difficulty in those subdivisions in those areas with uh both the safety of the kids and and of course the traffic patterns well we've tried in the design to try to accommodate for large queuing areas so to get parents and drop off off the street and large sidewalks that um go all the way around those drop offs we also like Gordon's working on safe routes for walking and biking. We, as a district, always encourage that. So it's hard to say, I guess, from my standpoint now, if how that would impact the site. But um, the site does have good flow through um, with the surrounding roads, and and hopefully that would accommodate. We never like to uh, overcrowd the school, so we. We try sure. to address that prior to, I mean, there's situations where we can't keep up with growth, but um, we try to keep it at uh, the eight, 900, 1,000 range, but uh, the school itself can accommodate that many. And we do have ample parking and, and drop off to hopefully accommodate all that. So if if you don't mind me asking, where looking at the site plan, where where is the drop off? As opposed to, it, I'm assuming we have both the bus drop off and a parent drop off and pick up. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. I'm just looking as to what that looks like. Sorry, I was talking and I didn't realize I was muted. Um, the school gives a little bit of leeway to the administrative personnel, the principal, to kind of have a little bit of a decision on which one they want to be the bus and which one they want to be the parent, um, depending on what they think is uh, best. They always try to give the, the principal the kind of the final say on that. But those are the two drop-off areas and they are one directional areas. So they would come in on captains and come out on Schooner. On this one, you, they're sharing an in and an out, but it's still one direction. So they would go, yep, follow those arrows. They would go up and then would come all the way around and go out. It's one direction traffic. That answered my question, thank you. Okay. If we don't have any more questions or comments, we'll go ahead and I'll entertain a motion. I'll make it. I'll move I move to, to a. Go ahead, Audrey. Go ahead. Sorry, I move to uh, to approval of the South Saratoga Elementary School site plan with the findings and conditions below. We have a uh, motion from Commissioner Barton. Second. Second from Kilgore. Yes. Commissioner Kilgore seconded. Sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, uh, do I have a question on the motion? All right, I'll go through the, I'll go through backwards this time. Uh, Commissioner Wagstaff. No, I don't have any questions on it. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Vote yes or no. Oh, I. Aye. 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 <laughs> yes. What did? How did you vote? Sorry, I missed. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Okay. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Okay. Commissioner McConkey. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Kilgore. Aye. And the Commissioner Cunningham, aye. All right, that item passes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gordon. I or an A, or does that have to, as long as it's an affirmative? Yes. 
I believe so. I think you'll probably do yes or no, but that's a, a legal question for Marin, who hasn't said anything. <laughs> Uh, it can be I or yes. You're good to go. Okay. okay, cool. All right. On to the next item, number five. This is a business item, preliminary plat for Jacobs Ranch, uh, south located approximately 25th, 2050 South, Lariat Boulevard, Patriot Ridge, LLC. Uh, Margaret Stoddard is the applicant, and this will be presented by Sarah Carroll with the city. Sarah, go ahead and take it away. Okay, great. Um, as you mentioned, this is a preliminary plat request in the Jacobs Ranch development. And this is an overall site plan. They have two phases and this shows the two phases combined and the open space, which is a drainage channel on the south portion of the property and an access trail. And also a continuation of the trail within the drainage channel. There's also an offsite portion of trail that will be completed with this as the current trail currently ends um, prior to the edge of this development. Uh, this is phase one. They meet all the lot size requirements and setbacks and things such as that. We have recently discovered that when um, this application first came in, they coordinated on the Foothill Freeway Boulevard alignment and there has been some slight changes. So there will be need to be some modifications to the west boundary line. However, uh, all of the lot sizes will still meet the underlying zoning. And this will be phase two and the, the same thing applies to the lots on the west edge. This is the proposed open space. They will be improving the trail, as I mentioned, and then armoring the drainage channel. Um, as you are aware, there was a flood several years ago after a fire and the lower portions of the channel have been armored. And it, it, this portion, we prefer that it be armored as well to handle any major events such as a flood after a fire. And we would like to give them open space credits for the trail and also the armoring. And we are proposing that the um, I think I've got that on the next. So oh, I'll go over the, oh, it's sorry, it's right here. <laughs> okay. So we are proposing 138.48 points be given to them uh, for uh, amenity points be given to them for the armoring and that's based on the cost of the armoring converted to points. And then they will have some extra open space that they and points that they could use as credit for future phases of development. Uh, there are some conditions of approval. There is some development near here within the Jacobs Ranch development that is owned by them. So we have Land Rock Estates here and the applicant has sold off these parcels so that the owners can extend their lots. However, they have not gone through a formal plat amendment to add those to their lots and pay for water rights. So we have a condition approval that that be cleaned up before this final plat is recorded. And then we would like them to confirm the Foothill Freeway Boulevard alignment and adjust their plans accordingly. And then as I mentioned, the open space amenity points, we would like to grant those for the drainage channel armoring. And here's the recommended, um, oh, where's the, sorry, there we go. There's the recommended motion with conditions of approval. The Freeway alignment is mentioned in the engineering staff report. It's not specifically called out as a condition here. However, it is in the engineering staff report. And then there's alternative motions for continuance or denial. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for that presentation. Uh, is the applicant available and would they like to make any additions to the presentation? Oh, that sounds good. Unless people have questions. Okay. All right. So I'll open up this to the commission. Ken, would you like to start us off? Okay. Um, I only have one. Yeah, actually, I was just going to ask the applicant to the applicant. Uh, this is a. Um, an administrative action. And so just for the record, would you, are you, is the applicant willing to comply with all the conditions in the um, uh, city staff planning pack, uh, 
city planning staff packet. Yeah, and I think that that's already in there, isn't it, Sarah? <clears throat> it doesn't say that you're going to comply. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's understood. I don't know any <laughs> issues there. Yeah, that, that's what that's what I was asking. Is if you see any issues with the conditions as they're listed now? I think um, we, for the record, I'd like to everything know. we went through, we tried to make sure we were looking through, you know, every document we could, you know, we're saying or looked up. So everything should be in compliance as far as I understand. Terrific. Um, so, Sarah, by the way, it's good to see you. We haven't seen you in a while. So, but uh, you yeah. as well, all of you as well. Um, so the canal armoring, I didn't see that anywhere in the packet that I had. Is that also in the conditions? Is that is that something new that we should add to the conditions when we make the motion or? Okay, let's see. I yeah. believe I have it in the checklist. It would be great to add it to the conditions. Because I don't remember reading anything about channel armoring. Okay, my apologies. Yeah, let's add that to the conditions. Okay. All right. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you, Commissioner Kilgore. Um, any other comments or questions from the? So I I don't think it's in the conditions, but I, on the staff packet that was handed to us on page the last page, page fifteen, it does talk about using the rip rope, the rip wrap, sorry, on the slope armoring. So it says it see engineering engineering plans for additional information. So it does talk about it, at least in the packet that was there, but I think it is a good idea if it's not there that we can add that. Sorry, I missed that. So is, is the rip wrap, is that what the channel armoring is then? Just the rip wrap? Sarah. I, oh yeah. I think Gordon will have to answer that. Um, I did in the checklist, it's mentioned in the open space review. Oh. Yeah, that's right. This is Daniel. Um, the rip wrap is the channel armoring. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't put the two together. Thanks for, thanks to Commissioner Ryan for bringing that up. That's that's good. Oh, you had Commissioner Ryan, or did you have anything? No, I actually, Commissioner Cunningham. Thank you. I have a uh, just okay, a go ahead. presentation. So on the packet also that we were given, I just want to make sure I understand with the freeway alignment on page twelve and what's coming in around lot nineteen twenty nine and lot nineteen thirty. I'm guessing this circle, this circle that's here at the end of that is now disappearing. Is that correct, Sarah, with the updated alignment? Is that what I'm seeing on page 12 of the PDF that was that was given to us for this item? I don't know if we can get to the same page or not. Yes. So there on the the um, next to lot 1929 and lot 1930, now the road is just going to have a straight dead end versus the circular. Uh, the circle there. Sure. You can see the in in this in the um, location map. You can see the red lines and how that will impact this. I think that they will still have room for that temporary turnaround. And the plan is then not to have anything surrounding that temporary turnaround. It's not showing anything on the on what's been submitted here on the plat. I just wanted to understand that that would just kind of be a, a a floating sort of turnaround out there by itself. And if it what what landscaping or what could be done around it, I guess. Or if there are plans for anything. That's a good question. Um, maybe the applicants can answer whether what their future plans for that location might be. A lot of times they intend lots or future road connections or things like that. Right. So the situation with that is, and we've been we talked to engineering a few times about that. So it's unclear right now what that would be used for that's why there's nothing there so in other words they don't know hey do we need to build something to go under or around or turn or so that is the situation right now so because what we wanted to do obviously is put lots there <clears throat> but then um this is what we what was kind of <laughs> given to us as the solution 
Yeah, and I appreciate that because that's what doesn't make sense in my mind is if I was the developer, right, I would want that that space available. Right. To me that yeah, would definitely. That space. And I think if, you know, even if you were the neighbor, that's what you would want. And right. I think right now it's unclear, you know, what even someone wants to do with that. In other words, what the city would want to do in the future is unclear, I believe. Yeah, and this is Daniel. I can... Um, what I remember, so we got to remember that that Foothill Boulevard is a mountain land association of governments project. And what I remember is, um, that Lariat Boulevard that you're talking about with the turnaround that, um, it wasn't, it's, so the Foothill Boulevard design is under design and it, it's, not sure if Larry Boulevard's going to uh, be a separated grade crossing and go under or over uh, Foothill Boulevard. And so there was a need of some buffer area. Um, and, and that's why it's shown like that. So that if the road has to raise or lower that there's room for uh, cut and fill slopes in that area to to accommodate those changes i appreciate that background i, I just it, I, it, i'm just worried a little bit that if we don't I, I don't know somehow account for that or address it here in the discussion you know then we end up with these sort of awkward empty spaces both for the developers interest and for the future city interest right that it's just these awkward remaining spaces that no one's taking care of and so um, I don't know if there's an ability to be able to address that in, in an additional condition, or if I'm out of line with that, I can certainly understand that as well. The other, the other quick question I had was, um, do we have precedent where we're kind of doing a, and at least if I read through the, 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 the packet item correctly, that we're essentially giving the credit for the land and then allowing for phase one to be built with the land, with the open space not coming until phase two. Is that correct, Sarah? We are going to ask them to put, um, to change their phasing so that the open space comes in with phase one. We don't want developments to get behind on open space. Okay, awesome. That, yeah, that, that is planned for sure, yes. Good question. Yeah, that was, that was part of my question. I appreciate you being able to address that and, and um, clarify that for me as well. The, the, the other related matter around that, um, I'm, I'm guessing this is something we've done in the past, so we're not you know, breaking any sort of precedent here in terms of of the strategy that we're approaching with is this something we've done in the past with the in terms of doing that with the credit of the land no we haven't done that before we have well i mean we have oh sorry yes we have given credit for for extra open space for to use for future phases yes we've done that before okay we haven't given credit a uh, points credit for armory armoring before but this is a unique situation Okay, and that, that was kind of my follow-up question to that is, is how was that credit points determination, I guess, assessed if it, where we're kind of treading in new water, which I'm, I, I want to make clear, I'm not necessarily opposed to. I just want to understand that if we're, we're kind of treading in these new waters that we're setting clear and defined precedent, that, you know, so if we need to have this similar situation next, next time around that we, we under, we're playing by the same set of rules for the, you know, the next developer that would come in and request such a thing. We do have a uh, dollar value assigned to all of our points. And so the points were assigned based on the cost estimate for the armoring. Okay. And then my final question, and sorry to ask so many questions. I've been largely silent today, so I think it's okay. But um, my last question is, I just want to quote it. Like from the city's perspective, um, city staff perspective, um, obviously we want to make sure that we armor this channel and we have this open space available. I just want, want to make sure that we feel like we're not um, exchanging good possible open spaces down the road for, um, I don't want to call this open space bad, but it's less than desirable, right? Because we're just putting a trail in there and a bunch of riprap. So as long as we're not throwing um, bad land after good or good land after bad, however you want to put that equation uh, in regards to the open space, I just want to make sure the city feels comfortable super, with what's, what's being- Super good, super good question. I can even speak to that for a second. So we're actually going to be doing you know, the lots, selling the lots, obviously, and then probably building homes along there. So we want this to be really nice. So we're actually going in, it's going to all be um, landscaped as well. So actually, this is going to be a super big upgrade. 
on what's traditionally been done down that channel. I, I appreciate does that, that. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. I, and I, I hope you, you know, can understand and respect that from the side of the, the for, at least from my perspective on the planning commission. I just want to make sure that we have attractive open spaces and that we're not yes. just making a swap, so, make a swap where we could potentially be um, releasing an obligation to have some better open space for these residents down the road, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that is a good question. And that's, we're actually, since we're actually doing the, the you know, we're, we're wanting to make this kind of nice out there. So that it sounds a lot. So. Yeah. Both for selling the lots and building homes. So, yeah. Okay. And from the city staff, Sarah, in the re your review of this, you are comfortable? Yes, um, we did. So from a staff perspective, we reviewed this in our development review committee, which is a staff meeting with most of our departments and um, include, you know, engineering, planning, public works, uh, legal. And we preferred the extension of the trail and the armoring um, and the, you know, the long term stability of this channel and the extension of this trail, which leads up the canyon. So there's a large park in this development. So it leads from that large park, which is also a detention basin, um, up the channel and then up the canyon further. So it, it does have, it is a highly beneficial trail. And also we preferred those types of improvements in this location rather than something else that's behind lots that, um, you know, such as a playground that's not visible because it'd be behind lots. There will be other phases in Jacob's Ranch uh, as it continues to develop so where we can get community open space for this development. I appreciate that, thanks. If this was the debate, my timer would have went off long ago, so I'll stop, but I just, that last piece of item out there is just that awkward piece of land adjacent to lot 1929 and 1930. I don't know if we can do anything there, if there's recommendation from city staff, but that, that would be my only remaining concern. And I'll stop, thank you. Who owns that, that piece of property? So, so we own that. Um, and like we're saying, when we brought that up the first time, I was saying, hey, we would want to do a cul-de-sac there, you know, with lots. But right now, engineering saying, hey, we don't know what we want to do there. Okay. So it's, I know, I, I agree 100%. It'd be quite a bit nicer if those were, if something else was there. So we're kind of, <laughs> I mean, 100% seeing where you're coming from and agreeing. So on that, once they get the engineering done for that area, they can always come back with a plat amendment, correct? That's correct. They could do a new plat and, you know, adjacent mm -hmm. to this and include that area, or they could do a plat amendment and add this. So there are different options they could choose from once that is resolved. So the, the best thing for us to do now is to move this forward as it is. And then when the engineering comes back or MAG comes back with what they're going to do with that exactly, then that can be addressed. Is, is the owner responsible for maintaining that area as far as like keeping the weeds out and all that? Or is that something the city's going to do or? The landowner is, would be responsible for weed maintenance. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Do we have any other Comments from the commissioners. If not, I'll go ahead and uh, I was going to say one thing um, <clears throat> about the uh, the armoring and the trail. I know we we give credit for tra trails and it, where it's going to lead into another park. I think that's that's a good thing, and I'm I'm not necessarily opposed to what we're doing here. I think it's a good thing, and I. I Remember when we originally did that point system, there was a, a provision in there that um, within the, the open space that, that other things could be added in that weren't necessarily part of a list. And so I'm glad that we have some flexibility that we're able to do this. And I believe from what I'm hearing, it sounds like it's gonna be a good addition, even though it may not be a traditional <laughs> addition, but it sounds like it's gonna be good. And that would be a nice place for residents to walk to the park so they didn't have to drive or something like that. Okay, that's all I have. I'm going ahead and uh, open this up for a motion. I'll make a motion. 
uh, on the wrong page. Okay, uh, I will have to pass. I've... Oh, I have a question. Are we going to add the um, condition about the channel armoring or, or did we decide that wasn't necessary because it's already in the, it turns out to be part of the engineering report? I think it would be great to add it as specifically as a condition. Just to be clear. Okay. All right. Why don't you go ahead and do that, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I could say something too, I, I feel like this was well thought through. So. What, my question or <laughs> the, or the plaque or the packet? That, that too. I think that the whole yeah. weighing things out, I, um, I've not seen this before. Of course, there's a lot of things I haven't seen, but. Um, but I, I, it just, it just strikes me that there's, there was some, it was just well thought through. There's some great consideration that was made in this. Okay. So. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. But um, Sarah, can you also, after I read this part, can you then go to the channel armoring thing? And that way I'll know what to say there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I move to forward a recommendation of approval to the city council for the Jacobs Ranch plat, South Preliminary plat, as outlined in the exhibits with the findings and conditions in the staff report, and with the additional condition that the, um, that the drainage channel armoring receive open space amenity points in the amount of 138.48 points. Commissioner Gilcover with a motion. Do we have a second on the motion? I'll second. second it. This is Commissioner Ryan. Can, Commissioner can Ryan make, with a se second. Can Any? I make a, a comment? First, uh, you said the south preliminary plat. Should that be a plat S? Oh, that might have been. Okay, so we have an amendment to the motion. Is this uh, is that okay with you, Commissioner Kilgore? Yeah, it is. I mean, unless it is south. Is that what the S stands for? Or is that just it, a it's 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 plat S, not not plat south. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then, so plat S. Then I yeah. Then, then I uh, I amend my motion to um, you know to, to the proper name plat S. And is that okay with Commissioner Ryan? Yes. Thank you. Good. Great catch. Thanks, Commissioner McConkey. All right. <clears throat> we'll go through and. Uh, do a roll call vote. Start with Commissioner Kilgore, yay or nay? Uh, yay. Aye. Yay. Commissioner yes. Anderson. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner McConkey. Aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. And Commissioner Wackstaff. Aye. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. We'll go. Uh, Congratulate the applicants and we'll move on to the next item, item number six. This is also a business item, concept plan for Fox Hollow neighborhood eight, located at approximately 400 West Wildlife Boulevard. Scott McCord is the applicant. This is also gonna be presented by Sarah Carroll. Okay, so this one is a concept plan, which is unique to the planning commission you don't see it very often. Normally these are a staff review. So the purpose of this is that it's in a planned unit development and therefore they will be asking for variations to achieve the density that's allowed within their planned unit development. So what you're seeing, the purpose of you seeing this is to give the applicant informal non-binding feedback on the proposed layout and proposed variations. So this is neighborhood eight. This future phase right here is currently owned by the LDS church. Uh, so we don't know if that will be a church or if it will be sold or if it will be divided or things like that. So what you're seeing here is the phase that they own. And we had asked them to, they had asked how much dens density, a lot of density for neighborhood eight, they should apply to what they own. And we asked them to apply it proportionately based on acreage. And so that is covered in the staff report. And then they will be asking for 
lot size variations to the underlying zone. So the R110 zone uh, requires 10,000 square foot lots. So their minimum would be 5591 square feet. And then they would also, what they're showing right now is um, a, a lot with minimum of 50 feet. And then the others they haven't proposed at this time with their concept plan and they can propose those and we can formally approve them with the preliminary plat. And at this time, we request that the Planning Commission provide them with feedback. Okay, would the applicant like to add anything to the presentation? If not, I'll go ahead and open this up to the Planning Commission. So with um, informal feedback, we uh, you can uh, pretty much discuss anything you would like, ask any questions you'd like. None of this is binding. So we have a little bit more leeway when we're asking questions or making comments. Commissioner Kilgore, your mic is hot, so I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, maybe this is what Sarah was talking about with what you, you mentioned acreage. I have, this, uh, I have a question about what it says in the executive summary. It says, um, is, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, it says the applicant was directed to propose a proportionate amount of the density. What does that mean? So we took, so in Fox Hollow there, in neighborhood eight, in the master development agreement, they are allotted a specific density number and because there's two owners in here, we asked them to assign the density based on their acreage. So we took the percentage of the acreage that they own and compared it and, and then assigned a percentage of the density. Okay, so a proportion is between the two owners. Right. Okay, and then I was gonna ask, where is that triangular piece of property? There is a triangular piece right here. Okay, that's what I thought. And they have shown a 40 foot wide access. That would only allow that to be one lot. There is a potential buyer that is asking if it could be more than one lot and they would really have to work on that together because the way that it's shown right now, it would only allow for one flag lot. Okay, and then that access, I was wondering, so it's gonna go behind all those those lots there or where, how's the access gonna, how's it gonna get to the road from that little triangular property? Right here where these green and blue lines are, those would be utility lines, but it would also be an access that a driveway could be installed. Oh, okay. That's kind of awkward. Is it, is that access big enough for fire trucks? Or uh, yes, so it's for, they provided a width of 40 feet and our code would require a minimum of 30 feet. Okay. Okay. Um, not that I want to hog up the time, but um, do we have other neighborhoods in Sertica Springs with setbacks and lot sizes that are similar to those in the variations that are requested? I mean, I guess we have smaller lots and stuff, but um, for this kind of a uh, development and land use, you know, are, are there similar uh, developments? Uh, well, there are. Um, within a lot of our planned community zones, we've seen similar lot sizes. And then within other phases in Fox Hollow, we've seen this and some phases in Harvest Hills. Okay. Yeah, I just wondering, because, you know, you, at least we used to get a lot of, um, pushback from residents when, because it, it seems like the density is getting really thick there. And we used to get a lot of pushback from that, but maybe uh, maybe it's not such a big deal and now when people are looking for, for more affordable housing. Um, I think, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. No other questions. Thank you, Commissioner Kilgore. Commissioner, I'll just go through the list and backwards. Commissioner Wagstaff, do you have any comments you'd like to make? I don't, thanks. Commissioner Ryan, do you have any comments or questions? 
I don't. We so we have lost it. I think the applicant was on earlier, but we've lost him now, and it seems David he's not on. I think it's more useful exercise if we had the applicant at least on the on the line with us. I don't have any comments. Sir, you can pass any comments we have. Yeah, I didn't realize he had, um, so it's Scott McCord and he was on earlier. Um, let me see, has he, he been trying to get back in? He had like five different things on and not very many were muted. And so we had to boot a few out, but it shows he was on. He had a couple still on for a while, but he's no longer on. Um, he sent me an email asking if he can get back on when it's his item, I guess he thought he got booted because of noise. Okay. I replied to him that we're discussing his right now. So um, if you see a request for him to, I don't know how it works if we have to accept mm -hmm. it or if he can just come back in. He, um, Marin, can they, hold off on moving forward on this and go to the other items to see if he can get back on. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. You can just make a motion to table this until the the applicant can get back on. It is just for informal com comment though. So it is something I can just pass on. It's, it's not for a mo formal motion. It's whatever the commissioners decide, they can put it on hold and and move forward with the next agenda item and come back, or they can move forward with um, their comments and a motion. So it's it's up to them to decide. Is there a motion on this? I thought that was just informal feedback. Oh, if it's sorry, if it's just informal feedback, then then okay. is that still up to you? <laughs> well, actually, I could use a break. <laughs> okay. His email response to me says that they are trying to get back in and can't get back in. I'm not sure and what's happening. Uh, I will try to resend them the link if you, uh, even though it's informal co uh, feedback, if he has things he wants to share, I mean, it's, it's simple enough to just go back to it. Okay, hey. do we wanna take a few minute break or? Yes, let's take about a five minute break. So let's go ahead and just mute and leave the video running so I don't have to restart it. Does that work, David Johnson? Uh, sure. Okay, so everybody just make sure you mute. Go grab a drink or something. And I will call us back in here in about five minutes.
I didn't make a note of the time. It was 48, so we're right there at five. Okay, cool. Thanks. And let me see if he... Uh, I still don't see Scott back on, and I've resent a link to him, so I'm not sure. Okay. Do, so. um, he replied to an email to me and said he tried the new link and still can't get back in. Hmm. I wonder if he has to clear his cache. If it's if it's informal feedback, I mean, you you can move forward and Sarah, like Sarah was saying, she can just provide that that feedback to him. Yeah, and we are recording as well, so he can have a copy. There you go. If he's okay. got some questions, uh, can they be asked through the email? Well, the item will have to come back before us for site approval. Yeah. And any, anything you say tonight is all just non-binding. It's to, to, to give them ideas, thoughts. Yeah, it works out. If you say, well, you know, it, it, it matches some of the, you know, other projects, some of the projects that have been done or in lot size that was brought up. And so <clears throat> not, anything you say tonight is not concrete. It's just ideas, suggestions, thoughts, basically. And, and any questions he has, he can get answered through staff. Okay. I, I would answer really fast that I would highly uh, discourage going back and forth emails with him as planning commission members as a group, because then that would be a meeting and it wouldn't be open to the public. So I, I think I Bryce think was asking since he was emailing back and forth with Sarah if Sarah could read any questions that he had via emails. I think during this meeting. Oh, that I think was, that was what I was asking. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think that would be fine if he wanted to ask the email questions. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I'm with Ken a little bit. Where five years ago there was a lot of pushback when there was this kind of when their lots the lot sizes were this small, right? I mean. Maybe it wasn't even five years ago, but I remember being crazy when when lots, you know, when a developer came with lots of size. But I'm not hearing it as much anymore. I mean, you're probably with me with that, Ken. I I'm not hearing that pushback like we used to hear all the time. Yeah, and I don't know how I feel about that, right? Like I want us, I want affordable housing because my kids are at that age where right where this is more affordable for them. But then I also I appreciate the bigger lot sizes just to kind of keep that feel as well. So I, I'm kind of torn, but again, we're not getting the pushback that we used to get. And, and this is allowed in the PUD overlay anyway. So. Well, yeah, one thing about the Fox Hollow development is they have a development agreement that was in that was entered into in 2013. So the density they're asking for is already vested. It's just um, the variations are a formality to achieve the density. Ask a question. Yes, go ahead, Anaheim. Commissioner Anderson. Um, on an item like this, is this kind of thing noticed? Will they notice those neighbors in that neighborhood adjacent about this discussion item tonight? No, it has not been noticed. And preliminary plats no longer get noticed. However, when we do present the preliminary plat, I will inform the HOA so that they can get the word out. So it won't be a public hearing, but your you can receive public comment. At, you know, optionally receive public comment if you choose to. Sarah, just for one point of clarity, this item was noticed. The, just the residents didn't receive individual notice, is what you're saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, we did not mail out, and we did not mail anything, and we did not put anything in the newspaper. It was on the agenda. Right, exactly. That's what I'm clarifying. That it was noticed via the agenda. So could the city council ask for that, I guess? Or like, I don't know, I'm just curious. When we review the preliminary plat, I will inform the HOA president so that they can get the word out. 
you know, you, you couldn't pick this subdivision over any other one and say, oh, we're, we need to notice this one. But, you know, the previous one, for instance, or whatever it may have been, where they didn't get it. They all have to follow uh, the standard noticing procedures. And in this case, there is no notice for a preliminary flat. Okay. Um, my only comment on this is uh, I, I want to keep something that's single family homes as much as possible. And at least, even though the lots are smaller, um, I would like to have seen some of the possible home designs. That would have been nice to see what, what they could fit onto smaller lots. And, and we, I know that's, go ahead. Uh, we will see the designs with preliminary plat in the PUD that is required. Okay. And, and I, I hope it helps us with our affordable housing to have the smaller lots and the single family homes. That's all I have. I, I, I guess I just still find it really weird that that access to that um, one lot there is that, you know, is that driveway between the two, you know, par parcels or two lots there. Um, what, what's going to go on the north? Is it north? Yeah, the north side of that driveway access, because if it's following that green, green, blue hash line, what's on the north side of that? Is that going to is, is, who owns that or what is that supposed to be? Yeah. So this area following the west boundary of this development is designated as open space in this Fox Hollow development. Oh, okay. So it's not like that driveway is going to somehow. <laughs> no, it won't allow for anything more. Yeah, okay. So if I may, about the driveway, uh, and commission, uh, I, this is my first time uh, li listening in on, so thank you for keeping our city, uh, uh, how do I say it, going. Um, I, I like how, like with the school zone, you were, you were concerned about uh, safety and concerned about traffic. And I, and I think that's nice you guys look for those. So, so, so thank you. Uh, I am looking to purchase that, that odd, triangular lot with that 40 foot, I guess, easement. And I would like to split it into, so subdivide into two separate lots. Uh, as it is right now, that's not possible uh, when I was speaking with Sarah about that. So I think that, I think it's, uh, oh, I can't remember the numbers, the 80, I'm just trying to pull it up, uh, 80, uh, I can't read that, um, but parcels just just to the south of where we're looking at. I, I think we need another easement to that parcel that, that I'm looking at. Let me pull it up. Is that something we could accommodate? Maybe we should have Oliver uh, list give us his name. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry. My name's Oliver. Yeah, Oliver Brown. Oliver Brown, Hi. right? Yes. And you're a, you're a, you're you're a potential landowner, or you own that? that I part? do not own it right now, but I would like to okay. purchase it. Is that for sale right now? All right. Um, it is. Oh, gee. But is it six oh eight, six oh seven, six oh six? Yes. So so either six oh six or six oh seven have a have an easement there also, so we could have access to. To, to two parts of it. Thank you for your patience. I was just trying to look it up. And that's not information we have available here, is that correct? Sarah, could you answer that? Yes, I was also answering a question from David Stroud on text. So what was oh, that? Okay. <laughs> Can there be an easement on 606 or 607? Uh, it could so, not be an easement. It would have to be a, a, a you know, a, we call it a staff. So it would have to be 
outside of those lots, not in those lots. Do you call it a staff? Yeah, we call it we call this a staff to a flag lot. So we so it would need to be not an easement over those lots because okay. Um, so it needs to be something similar to this, like in between lots yes. or something like that. So there's probably a couple of different options um, that that I would recommend they discuss with the developer of neighborhood eight. Uh, there's possibly the potential to put it in the middle and um, uh, share that or something like that. I don't know how that it affects these potential utility locations. Another option is this development to the south is a different owner. I wonder if it's an option to come in from that direction. However, they won't be developing this area for a while because of water. So this, this area here in neighborhood eight is in a serviceable area. However, just behind them is would need additional infrastructure in the city before it can be serviced with water. Um, but I do see some different options that could be discussed. What I think would be best would be to put them in touch with the uh, developer of Neighborhood 8 so they can have a conversation about it. That sounds great. Thanks, Oliver, for your comments. Do I have any awesome. in the um, Planning Commission questions? I do, Commissioner. Um, Go ahead, Cunningham. Commissioner McConkie. Um, just a, a random thought here is, the, I don't know if the uh, utilities would allow or accommodate, but doing some lot shifting to create a center access point to that, maybe through what's now 607, could create a center access to that where you've got, could split that potentially. Um, I did have a question um, the adjacent um, phases, let me zoom in here, um, oh, it's not labeled. On each side of this development, or on, the, on the, the side of the development to the, what is that, to the east, are, do these have the same lot sizes and did this follow the same process and gain approval for the smaller lot sizes? To the south, they do not. So the south is not in a PUD overlay zone. Um, however, to the east, they the are east. also in the Fox Hollow PUD overlay and they have reduced lot sizes. Okay, so we've already approved the reduced lot sizes there then. Right, there's already been some reductions approved. Yeah, um, in that abutting development. Uh, and then the adjacent, how many phases as we keep going there to the, I think it's east. My copy's a little, yeah. To the east, how many other phases have reduced lot sizes? There are, um, so as we go to the east, there are um, two phases that have received reduced lot sizes. Okay, and how uh, how long ago were those developed? We're we talking five years ago, ten years ago. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. There it is almost also a development to the north that's under construction. And are they also reduced lot sizes there as well? there yes mm -hmm. it just seems to me that we're that we're already setting a precedence and, and we have already set a precedent because of the master development agreement so the master development agreement was redone in 2013 it was done previously to that so these densities for these neighborhoods have been in place for a long time okay that answers my questions thank you Any other comments from the Planning Commission? Well, 
this is probably a really dumb question, but did they, so when you talk about 2013 and all that, so did they buy, like when they acquired this property was at the R110 where it was the 10,000 square foot requirement. And now they're just asking, right, to do smaller lots. Is that, I mean, how is that? The way that this development agreement works, um, so we no longer do PUDs, but a PUD is a planned unit development. And what happens is a plan, in a planned unit development is they give larger open space areas in right. exchange for um, clustering lots and yes. density. So this development has 25% open space, which is quite a bit more than our standard our minimum in a single family neighborhood right now is 10%. Right. 25%, um, they have several parks in here and then they have in the upper uh, westerly regions of the development, they have a lot of native areas in the hillsides on the mountain. And so uh, that equates to 25% open space and in exchange, they get variations on lot sizes. So each neighborhood is assigned a certain density and so the density is vested for each neighborhood with the master development agreement. And then what the variations that they ask for will allow them to achieve that density. And so we do see at several different lot sizes within these phases. So the, the 5591, I believe that's in the staff report as the minimum is the smallest lot in here. However, there are several lots that are quite a bit larger than that. Right, okay. Again, that was just me learning and stuff like that, so I appreciate it. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item. Thank you, Sarah, for that presentation. Next item is going to be a public hearing this time. Update to code title 19, sections 1902, 1905, 1906, 1909, 1912, 1914, 1924, and uh, this is city-initiated. Um, this will be presented by David Stroud and Tippy. I think it's Moreland, right? Yeah, we'll also have uh, at the, the last item, Mayor and Barker will also be uh, going over some of those changes. Um, okay. I'll, I'll share the screen now. What, what I've got, well, I'll share is I'll, I'll bring up the text. Uh, there's basically three sections to what we're looking at tonight. Uh, for text amendments. One is for the permitted uses. One then deals with food trucks. And the other one is bonding requirement changes um, that are uh, necessary due to changes in state law. So, so I will go to share the screen. All right, so the, the, the first uh, section as indicated in the staff report, uh, this is not a request of city staff. This is a request of Mr. Joe Scoville and I did see that he is on, uh, hopefully he's still on. Uh, he is looking at the at some, some property to purchase and has some potential buyers for the property uh, that would like to put a residential facility for elderly because we are right in the middle of doing these changes now. I said, okay, great, we'll throw it on, on these ones. So again, uh, the, this first request is not, uh, does not originate from city staff, but Mr. Scoville. And uh, he is here again present uh, if you'd like to ask any questions. So currently right now, uh, our residential facility and residential for disabled are allowed in the mixed use and the mixed waterfront zone as indicated on the, uh, the chart you see. Uh, the change would be to add uh, the red P for permitted as you see for the RC for residential for elderly and then P for residential with for disabilities in the, the community commercial. And with that said, we can uh, ask Mr. Uh, Scoville if he'd like to, to say anything about this and uh, go from there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, sir. Oh, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am the uh, real estate agent for Mr. Fred Fenlison and his wife, 18 acres up on uh, Pony Express Parkway. And uh, it's a beautiful spot. And uh, Mr. Fenderson had changed the zoning to community commercial. And I've had multiple requests for assisted living, some for the 18 acres, complete 18 acres, some for just the smaller uh, unit, uh, five or six acres. And I went up to the 
Planning Commission, and I talked to David Stroud. He's been very nice. Talked to Sarah Carroll. She's been very nice. Uh, talked to David Johnson just the other day. And uh, this is my first time I've had any business to doing with Salt Lake County. I mean, excuse me, with uh, Saratoga Springs. But uh, I've been very pleased, and uh, everybody's been very helpful. Uh, we hope that they would consider this. We want to bring something that's nice to pull that property. It's a very, very prime piece of property up there. Got a beautiful home on it. Got a beautiful outlook, overlooks the, the lake. There'll nothing to be built below it that can actually obstruct the vision of, of that property. And for a, for a uh, assisted living, I have seen, and I've been involved with some of the assisted livings, in, like in one in Draper, where did you have that? three quarter acre and you had about 80 units and there was no room for anybody to walk, nobody for the, for the people to walk. And they had the uh, people who were there for Alzheimer's. And so I was thinking that this property here just lends itself. It's a community property. It's in between Eagle Mountain and uh, Saratoga Springs that uh, the majority of the, the, the Tenants there will be from the community. And I just thought that that was just a great, great application. And uh, I put my request in and uh, David Stroud was very nice with me and said he was gonna be before that. And here we are. Uh, if you got any questions, I'd be glad to answer. But I don't have a buyer right now, but <clears throat> this is in preparation of getting a buyer. So, uh, Mr. Chair, if I can take a moment just to kind of talk about this request. Yes, go ahead. So uh, the Planning Commission, you should have received my email earlier. Um, while I understand the request of the, the property owners and their realtor, um, I believe this is the wrong approach. Um, if they would like to uh, accommodate for um, uh, resi elderly residential living and assisted living, what they should request is, is a zone change. Um, to amend a community commercial and regional commercial zones, which are designed uh, to bring in uh, sales tax generation, um, what we would essentially be doing is creating, allowing um, uh, residential units to eat up commercial space. And so I, I, while I understand their approach and I actually believe that there are zones such as mixed waterfront and mixed residential that allow for this type of commercial and residential mix. Um, I, I believe amending uh, commercial codes to allow for residential uses is not the right approach. Um, in addition, I, I met uh, with this gentleman just the other day, I just met him. And since then, I've actually spoken with a couple developers who are actually interested in this property uh, for, for commercial uses that would meet the current zoning. And so um, I, as a staff, as from economic development uh, perspective, would recommend against um, amending the code to allow for this. Instead, we should um, encourage the the property owner to either um, uh, pursue other types of uses and developments or submit um, uh, a zone change. Although please keep in mind that this zone was just changed, I believe uh, less than two years ago. So um, with that said, I, I believe that the uh, allowing for residential use would take away from the commercial viability, especially the commercial viability that this will expand into uh, over the next few years. And just to make a correction also, I apologize, there should be a P here also under community commercial as the proposal. Uh, if you saw when I had the map brought up, um, Bring them back up here. I'll show you the property that the applicants ask you about. So th this is the the Finlandson property here. These two, and so the zoning there. You can it's community commercial. So that chart uh, that you have should actually have a P under the other as well. So whatever whatever your motion is tonight, please make that correction in the for the minutes. Hey, may I say something? Yes, you go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, in regards to uh, Dave Johnson, uh, I intend, I sent him an email earlier this, this evening, tell him I intend to certainly follow up with uh, Dave in regards to the commercial prospects that he has, because uh, it's my job to make sure that uh, I get as much exposure to my client's property and that we get the right, right tenant in there that the city will be proud of. So I have no intention of uh, ignoring uh, Mr. Johnson's recommendations in, uh, in regards to the two other developers. And I'd be glad to, because he told me that the other day when we was talking, that he had a couple guys. And I said, great, I'll be glad to, to uh, talk to him. Yeah, and and I, th I, I would add um, to his thoughts that, you know, I, I uh, like I said in the beginning, this um, I think there's just a different approach um, rather than what has been requested here because what's being requested here would have wide spanning ramifications on all of our commercial zones. Uh, essentially, it, it could cause for regional commercial zones to be filled with um, residential facilities. And so I don't think that's something that uh, as a city we want to see as a uh, Planning Commission or even the City Council would like to see. So, uh, you know, my, my recommendation is um, to uh, make a motion not in favor of this amendment. And then I can work with the property owner and uh, Mr. Scoville uh, with, you know, other approaches and avenues to um, making their property commercially viable within the zone that they have. Thank you, David Johnson. Um, uh, Planning Commission Director Stroud, do you have any other com comments or can I turn this over to the commission? David, you're on mute. There, there you go. go. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Commissioner, comments, please. Okay. Now, do we want to uh, act on each of these items separately? That's, that's my feeling right now is we should probably act on them separately. Yeah, or you could do it all as one, but you have the, the change the rec recommendation to if you choose to say no to this one that's up to you i mean totally our call mr chair okay all right so um i'm gonna go ahead and open this to the commission any commissioners that would like to ask questions or make comments about these items i just want to say when i read this request i mean i i assumed it was city initiated at the time so i did find it very odd that we that the city thought that this was a, a good idea, um, and now that I know what the background is, um, I do feel that it's it's even odder that we allow that that we go ahead with a um, a zoning amendment based on maybe one or two realtor you know uh, developers, um, whereas. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree with the, the, the previous comments that uh, this is maybe not the way to do it. Um, although we welcome, you know, you know, those kinds of develop, we welcome all the developers, especially the assisted living type of um, developers or that kind of facilities for our city. But um, I just don't feel comfortable making a, an amendment to our zone code um, based on the request of what a developer might want to do. So, although, Sometimes that gives us good ideas, but maybe not in this case for the reasons stated before. Thank you, Commissioner Kilgore. Any other comments from the commission? And not just about um, this, but the uh, um, food trucks and and the bonding as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into those after you're done discussing this section. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I do, I just, I um, for the residential, facilities for elderly persons. I feel like that's appropriate in a commercial zone. Like that's, even though it says residential in the term, this type of use is probably more applicable in a commercial zone than in a residential zone, like a neighborhood to have that type of um, elderly person's facilities. That's to me, that's more of a commercial use. It, and we have commercial zones that allow for that. So the, the thought is, we wouldn't want to allow it in our primary commercial zones, um, whereas we have commercial zones that do allow for these types of uses, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, and I get that. I just don't think the... why community commercial wouldn't be an appropriate place for an assisted living for a commercial. Hey, uh... David Johnson, could you, uh, where are those areas that allow that right now? Can you, I mean, is there? Yeah, it's it's called mixed residential and right. mixed waterfront. And the intent of mixed residential is to allow for, you know, residential uses, facilities, things like that with other types of commercial uses mixed in. Um, okay. So, and, and even those need a little bit of clarity, which the council has mentioned just recently, needs a little bit of work and clarity on how um, that is implemented. What that means. Mm -hmm, exactly. Because in right now, kind of one of the unintended consequences in mixed commercial is a lot of um, developers want to make like one section residential and then one section um, uh, commercial rather than it being kind of intermixed, like is the intent, if that Which makes sense. Which is what it, right. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, in the same way that not every zone allows every type of use, we've done that here where um, a res residential facilities like this are allowed in some zones, but not every zone, because, for example, in regional commercial, you don't want a residential um, facility right next to Fat Cats and Costco, if that makes sense. And so it's trying to plan how and where those types of commercial faci uh, re residential facilities are placed in in a commercial zone. Great, thank you. Okay, any other? I have comments? a I have a question, uh, Commissioner um, Cunningham. Do we have uh, formal definitions uh, for residential facilities for elderly persons and residential facilities for persons with disabilities? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in here. You do. It's in your staff report. Okay. And just to go back, that. clarify uh, Dave Johnson's comment. Uh, he did. He said mixed residential. I don't think that was his intent. It's the mixed use and the mixed waterfront zones. Oh yeah, my apologies. Yes, mixed use, not mixed residential. Thanks, That's Dave. Small clarification there. Okay. And I, I was, I'm looking at the master plan right here. What, what was the other one? You said uh, the uh, mixed waterfront and and mixed use, not not mixed residential. Thank you, Dave Stroud, for catching that. I don't see it on this. Yeah, I've had some lag here, so I may have missed your comment there. Uh... I don't have any other questions. Dave, can you, are you able to show, sh screen share those definitions? I think that's what um, Commissioner McConkie's looking for. He's having a hard time finding it in his packet. There on the yeah. packet that was provided there on page two, I believe two in the right at the top of page two of the PDF in the packet. There we go, found it, thank you. I think Commissioner Cunningham, if I can just interject with, with a comment, I think it sets a dangerous precedent if we start bouncing back and forth between these type of designations <clears throat> based on uh, spe specific requests like this where accommodations are made elsewhere in the city. So I personally am not in favor of this change. Just wanted to put that out there. I just don't feel like where we have accommodations made available where it's clearly outlined that those uh, these type of facilities are certainly welcome and we want them in the city and we believe we have a, a certain place for them. I don't, I don't believe we should go about um, based on each request making these type of changes, especially where I believe it was mentioned either from um, Director Johnson or Director Stroud that uh, this was all updated as little as two years ago. So I think we need to be cognizant of that as a, as a commission as well. Okay, any other comments from commissioners? I just have a quick question. Um, Go ahead, Commissioner Wagstaff. And maybe David Stroud might know this. So here a few months ago, we changed a lot of things from conditional to permitted. Do you know if they used to be conditional and turned to prohibited and got taken out? Or has this never been allowed in community commercial? It, it was never allowed in okay. the community. Yeah, I don't think it was. There wasn't even conditional use. Okay. I just know we got rid of all the conditional use stuff. So, okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to come down on the side of, I, I would like to keep the, 
our big commercial uses like community commercial and especially regional commercial commercial because I can see if we open this up that we're going to lose the commercial and we have lost a lot of commercial and business over the years to residential and uh, I, I'm definitely not in favor of any kind of move towards that. However, I'll also say that we are well, would be willing to welcome any of the other uses. Um, and like um, David Johnson said, go ahead and apply for a, a zone change if that's uh, the best thing that you want to do there. Um, I'll go ahead and turn the time back over to Planning Director Stroud so he can, or we've just got the next, the next item, food trucks or bonding. Mr. Kennedy, I'm just a point of clarification. Do we need to make an official motion on this? I think he was, was going to present and then we're going to do a motion at the end. Well, I'm talking, I'm talking about the previous uh, proposed change on the uh, residential facilities. Are we tackling these one by one? Or are we going to make a, an all-inclusive motion for all, I believe, three of these changes? I want to do it one by one. So if we are doing that, then do we need to make a motion to, to not move forward with that recommended change or do we just dismiss it and move on? I'm just, sorry, I'm just learning. We're gonna have to make a motion, right? Um, yeah, you, 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 you'll still make, make a motion. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I've been getting an unstable connection here the last few minutes. Uh, okay. Yeah, you make a motion then on, on this if you wanna do it uh, individually. Uh, it would still be up to the applicant. Again, he never filed a formal application. If you go, do go with a recommendation of denial or even if you, you know, recommendation of approval, uh, the applicant and still say, no, I'm just going to withdraw my request. That would be up to him. But you would still make a formal uh, recommendation. I guess the question now is do we want to do that now or do we want to go for the rest of the presentation and then then do it? So legally, I think it, it would probably be cleaner to do each one separately than to do a whole big one together because you may want to make changes or modifications in some of the other ones. Okay. So then can let's I, go ahead. Can, and I'll can I have a, one more, one last say? Go ahead, sir. Uh, I will do whatever the city and the planning commission wants. If uh, you decide to uh, not to make that text amendment, I'll live with it and we'll just bring you a good commercial development up there. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Scoville. All right, so I'll go ahead and entertain a motion at this time for the change of uh, use, permitted uses. I would like to make a motion not to move forward with this, uh, with the um, proposed amendments. What you do, uh, Commissioner McConaughey, would you need make a recommendation to deny? And then okay. it could be up to the applicant. Or, well, again, you do a formal application. He could just tell us, I'm going to drop it. Don't, don't carry it on to the city council. But you still would do a formal recommendation. So I make, I'm looking for, there's no verbiage in this document, correct? To follow uh, on this one. Do you see one, it on so the screen now? No. Dave, your screen stopped sharing a while ago. Oh, no, it's kind of got booted quick. Oh, I see it here. Yeah, on page four, isn't it? Yeah, uh, the negative option is on five. Five, okay. Option one. Well, we here it is, found, found it. The, uh, the actual I uh, found it. number. So I'd like to make a recommendation to forward a negative recommendation. I'd like to make a motion to forward a negative recommendation to the city council for, uh, pardon me. Okay, let me go back to it here. All right, option three, the negative, just yes. zero four is what you're looking at. So you just pull that one. Commissioner McConkey, I think you're good to move forward with your, your well, motion. 1904. Yeah, 1904. Okay. So we have a motion from Commissioner McConkey. Do we have a second? 
I will second. This is Commissioner Ryan. Okay, second from Commissioner Ryan. Do we have a question on the motion? All right, so we'll go through a roll call here. I'm gonna vote first this time because I've been voting last and I'm gonna vote nay on this one. Commissioner Kilgore. Wait. Yeah, yeah I, I think vote aye. Aye. Sorry, it looks like I'm having issues. Oh yeah, aye, right sorry. <laughs> yes. In this case, yes, aye. <laughs> and then Commissioner Kilgore. Uh, aye, as well. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner McConkey. Aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. And Commissioner Wagstaff. Aye. Commissioner Wagstaff, did you, I, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Aye. Aye, okay. So it's unanimous, so that, that motion uh, passes <laughs> to not recommend to the city council to change the the designation. So we'll go ahead and move on then. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just jump in here. I've gone off video. I'm, I'm getting some a, a warning of bad connection. Don't know what's causing that, but maybe my video feed, something's going on. So for now, I've gone off video. Okay. Uh, so the next item, yeah, the next item would be, uh, and, and I'll introduce this, but this will then, Tippy will go through this. She's the one that uh, spearheaded the changes to the, the food truck ordinance. We had received uh, direction from mayor and the county. Dave Stroud. Uh, maybe it might be best to have Tippy do the screen. Council to look at the food truck ordinance. We, this year, uh, put a food truck in a residential zone. Uh, yes. What's that? D Tippy, do you have this document so that you can screen share because Dave's current connection issues? Um. I'm not sure. Is this just the packet? Yeah, it's in the packet. I have packet. the word doc, but I don't have the rest of the changes after the food truck as well. But I can Tippy, go over I, I, Yeah, I just pulled up the uh, the staff report under the uh, Planning Commission packet folder. Okay. And, that, and Dave, that might help some of the connection issues too. now so yeah what, what Dave was just saying is that the council had asked us to look into how we can allow food trucks on private property so that um, individuals or HOAs can have them in a safe manner so um, just to summarize the changes that we have here we updated the the definitions to match state code so they don't actually um, we used to say mobile food vendor which was previously used in the state code and then now we use the term food truck again. So we updated all those definitions. Sorry, <laughs> talking while I'm looking for the packet here. Um, then we also removed food truck regulations from the temporary use section of the code. Uh, this section of the code requires a temporary use permit for every instance. And we didn't want to require uh, food trucks to have to come in with a site plan and get a permit every single time they wanted to come into the city. So we thought the best response would be to create its own section in our uh, supplemental standards. So we did that and we established a couple of pages of standards. Um, the, the first section of the standard says like where and when they can park. Uh, it's things like they have to park on a hard surface, they have to provide trash receptacles, uh, and it provides standards for things like if they have a canopy for um, operating to non-vehicular service, like it can't be a drive-through. Um, and then the other part of the standards indicates what zones they can go in. So currently, or the, the packet as it's loading here shows that food trucks would be allowed in any commercial zone where food vendors are allowed. So if we have any form of restaurant that's allowed in a specific commercial zone, then it would also allow a food truck. And then for residential zones, it's allowed only on private property. So it can't be parked on a public street. It can't be parked on public property without getting a special events permit. Um, and that's that's the summary of what we have there. Tippy, if I if I can add a little bit to that summary. So it, it, the allowance in the commercial zone, obviously those food trucks have to have permission from the property owners in those commercial zones. Likewise, if it's um, if it's on a property like somebody's residence, their home, if it's having um, if it's going to create traffic on the roads, 
or crowds of any sort, they would be required to have a special event permit. And it has to be solely contained on the private property, essentially is the clarity. Am I explaining that correct, Tippy? Yes, yes. And this has come up during um, the pandemic shutdowns. A lot of food trucks wanted to come in to provide services to certain neighborhoods, but certain HOAs, um, certain residents were just requesting that food trucks come to their homes. Uh, and this was, we've gotten a lot of questions about that. So this is a response to that. Um, Tippy, I have the, the packet pulled up for me. Did, did it load up for you yet? Sure, it's just barely, it's a big packet. So it's still mm -hmm. loading. Let me, if I can, maybe I can get there first for you, so. Sure. If you pull up just the, my staff report, it's, it's a lot shorter of a document. Uh, let's oh, try. It's only the whole packet, right? Oh, I'm not on the VPN because Zoom doesn't work if I'm on the VPN. Um, okay, I've, I've got it here. You got it now? Okay. Yeah, let me just pull it out and share my screen. So this section here just updates the definitions to match the state code, food truck, food cart, event permit. And then we remove um, the, all references to this from the temporary use chapter. So that's what you're looking at here. And let me know if I need to zoom in or go slower. Okay, and then here are the standards for food trucks. So these are the parking limitations, um, these closely match what we're allowed to do uh, through the state regulations. And Marin helped me work on this quite a bit in, in the very end as well. Um, these closely match what other municipalities are doing in the state as well. Um, yeah, access is by pedestrians only, uh, clean and orderly condition, uh, pretty standard. Um, regulations for where they're located. Number two here is the commercial zoning. Yep, it's permitted wherever food establishments are allowed. And then three is they're permitted in residential zones entirely within private property and um, they can't occupy required, required parking so that this doesn't generate parking on public streets or traffic issues on public streets and that sort of thing. Um, this indicates when event permits are required and then business licenses. This, this is exactly from the state code. If they have a business license in any other city or, or government entity in the state, then we give them a reciprocal business license. So they don't have to do anything else. They come into the city and we print off a Saratoga business license for them. Um, Yep, and then the, they have to comply. Yeah, are there any questions from the Planning Commission at this time? So any Planning Commissioners have any questions they'd like to ask? Commissioner Cunningham, Ms. Commissioner Ryan, I just have a couple of really brief, quick questions. So I think, Tippy, you had mentioned, which I appreciate that there's a matching of state code and streamlining in the process, and I appreciate that. I think you also mentioned that language you've taken here is in line with other municipalities, I believe you mentioned. And, and I guess the third piece that, that puzzle that I would that I would like feedback on is whether um, any outreach was made to food truck vendors to say, hey, are we out of line with any of this or is any of this seem, you know, particularly onerous and from your approach or are we in line with what you expect and or business practices in, in similar municipalities of our size and or, or the state that we're in where, where, you know, food trucks are certainly welcome where we don't have a lot of eating options. Yeah, uh, we didn't talk directly to food truck vendors after writing this, but they, I know several had asked us to allow them on private properties. So, so that's what we've aimed to do. And I, so when I worked in Lehigh City, I wrote the original mobile food vendor um, ordinance for Lehigh City. So I've worked pretty closely on them. And when I worked in Park City, I helped with that ordinance as well. So um, I guess we took a lot from that background as well. You're the food, tr you're the food truck pro then, huh? A little bit. So from this city event side of things, um, hand economic development, I've talked, I've spoken with several food truck vendors about this issue and they're aware, they're aware uh, at least several of them, especially those who have 
been impacted more or less by this are aware of this. And um, I, while, like Tippy said, we didn't run this specific wording past them, this is the general premise of what they've requested. Um, and so if Tippy is saying that it's consistent with state and code in other cities, um, that's a lot of what the food trucks mentioned to me was comparing it to other cities and what other cities allow. So I would say there, hopefully we're going to get good support from the food truck vendors for this. I know a couple of them mentioned to me, they were very excited for this change. And then how, uh, my, my last question is how's this event permit permitting process? We envision mm -hmm. this being a, a rather quick turnaround for them, or is it something that, you know, gets um, bureaucracy? Well, what I envision is that they don't need to have an event permit if they can ensure that it's solely on private property or commercial property. Um, so if, you know, if we get um, a food truck vendor that keeps creating backlog on residential roads and things like that, then we'll, we'll approach that food truck vendor and say, hey, if this is how you're um, running this, you need to apply for a uh, special event permit under uh, the block party section, essentially. Um, but we would rather just encourage them to continue this type of practice completely on the property and make sure it's done in a fashion that doesn't create any kind of large public gathering, which to be honest, um, you know, a couple of these that have occurred solely on private property before it, this has been passed, um, haven't created really much of a backlog. And I think that's part of why we're making this change. So I don't foresee a, a big need to get a special event permit, if that makes sense. But if a neighborhood, for example, there's been a couple neighborhoods that wanted to bring in like two or three food trucks, um, that may require special event permit. Hopefully I'm making sense with some of the nuances with this. Yeah, I, I appreciate the clarification. And, and that's really kind of where I was getting at as well, because we're, you know, it's clearly stated, you don't want them rolling up on lawns or, you know, on the sidewalks and things of that nature. And, and so they'll likely be on public city streets in a lot of instances, I would guess. And so I'm just kind of wondering how uh, well, onerous a process that would be for them to go through to have the permitting. Yeah, well, technically, and Tippy, correct me if I'm wrong, technically, they do need to be completely on the property owner's driveway or lawn or whatever, and not on city streets. So if if they are going to be on city streets and something along those lines, they need to fill out a special event permit. Um, shall not be parked in public street. Or park. Yeah, thank you, Tippy. Um, they a special event permit would be needed in uh, in the same manner that a block party would be conducted. But they would the food trucks and stuff still would need to be on somebody's driveway on the private property. So hopefully, I'm not sounding confusing. <laughs> in that explanation. Yeah, you know, I'm going to chime in here. This is Marin. Um, the state has a whole section of code and it's called Food Truck Licensing and Regulation Act. And so they, they really do limit what a city can and cannot require of food truck businesses. And so we really stuck to what the state allows the city to regulate. So there's really not a whole lot of wiggle room um, for what we can make a food truck do. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that, that we really are complying with state code on this. Excellent, thank you. I have a couple questions. Uh, so I'd just like to understand the impact of this then. So um, if on commercial property <clears throat> around other food vendors, so how does, Let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think, um, does a city benefit? Okay, so if there are restaurants, you know, this is brick and mortar buildings where people have, uh, restaurant owners have you know, invested leases and franchises and all that. They pay property tax, they pay sales tax, and then you have a food truck that doesn't pay property tax, I'm guessing. Um, do they pay sales tax or does it pay, does it go to the county or, you know, how it goes to in uh, Marin or Tippy, maybe, you know, better than me, but my understanding is that it goes to wherever their business license is. Okay. So then we're kind of inviting then, is, <clears throat> am I correct in thinking that we're inviting outside vendors who don't pay taxes here, maybe to compete with um, brick and mortar buildings, 
you know, or, or rather restaurant owners who are in these buildings. Um, so we're kind of setting up that kind of competition. Is it a fair competition? And it, does it benefit the city as far as finance? And concerned? that has been some of the argument against of those who are against allowing more flexibility with food trucks. But as Marin stated, the, the, the state has made it pretty clear um, what food trucks are allowed to do, which is why they've written this in a way that aligns with that. And to be honest, several of the food trucks that have approached me have actually been Saratoga Springs citizens with Saratoga Springs um, business licenses who are paying taxes here and are trying to do their food trucks in our city. And so, yes, it does invite food trucks from outside, but part of the um, negative impact that it's having, it's not allowing those with business licenses here and residents here to um, utilize their food trucks more within the city that they they live and work in, if that makes sense. So you're right on property taxes and such. So it's it's kind of a double edged sword. Well, I, I mean, I, I I could see that it's a benefit. It's a it's a benefit for residents because it gives us those options and <clears throat> those that flexibility. And of course, the food truck folks, uh, you know, that um, industry would like it. But what does what do restaurant owners think? I mean, do have oh. they say, oh yeah, we love oh. food trucks or or otherwise? So private, no, I, private property, they would have to have the private property owner's permission to be on the site. So what we've seen a lot of in the city so far is where a business will invite other food trucks or specific food trucks to come. Like if it's, you know, a dinner shop, they'll invite like a donut food truck to come and work with them together and it boosts sales altogether. Uh, Provo, when they were writing their food truck ordinance, did extensive studies on this. And it didn't found that it didn't take away from the brick and mortar business, uh, if I recall correctly. Okay. Sorry, and Mary. Well, no, yeah, I can answer that. that. Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone else saying something? Yeah, sorry. This is Marin. I can answer that as well from the state code standpoint. The city is not allowed to prohibit food trucks in a zone that allows food establishments. So yes. we can't prohibit that. We can't even constructively prohibit it. And we can't prohibit either how far away or how close they are to a restaurant. No, so those no, are yeah, I understand that. I, I was just wondering what the impact is. Yeah, so Commissioner Kilgore. So um, building on what Tippy was saying, um, what we're finding is brick and mortar businesses are inviting food trucks because it creates a synergy and, and a draw and makes people linger more in those brick and mortar areas. They're, they're kind of supporting each other when, you know, historically it's kind of been that question and brick and mortars have almost pushed a little bit against food trucks, but I think we've evolved a little bit since then. And I think there's been some concession on, Hey, you know, this actually draws more people. It's, it's no different than the snow cone stand that draws a little crowd and people sitting out and hanging around the brick and mortar stores, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And then on the residential side, <clears throat> so I think um, I, I was when I read the when I read the the proposed code, um, I got the idea that it's possible for my next door neighbor to put a food truck on his lawn um, and operate at seven from seven a.m. to ten p.m. for as long as he wants, as long as long as that's what he got the um, the um, the was the, the use for because there's no it's no longer seasonal it could be all year long and it could be on his grass right on, in his front yard operating from seven in the morning with all the generators and everything is that wrong is that a wrong picture of what the code is al allowing for or is that well, basically what be, we're allowing it would have to be on a hard surface so it could only be on his driveway okay so then the driveway uh, but, but the state code prohibits us from limiting the hours of operation and numbers of days of operation um, so that's why that is not in there. Well, yeah, I thought the code said from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. Yeah, so beyond that, what we have in there is the, the maximum that the state code will allow us to regulate um, 12 okay, hours so in a 24-hour period. Okay, so then I guess what it is saying then that is that, yes, my next-door neighbor can put a food truck with the generator and everything on his driveway and run it set from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day all year long. 
7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 12 hours, and they have to move it. Oh. So you can't have it parked, not just operating for 12 hours. You have to move it? Wait, what? what? Yeah. So this first one here, okay. food truck cannot even... be parked for more than 12 hours in a 24 hour period in any one location and no overnight parking is allowed. Okay. So they do have to leave it, but they, but it can come back every day. Yeah, there, there was no, even a weekly, we couldn't limit um, the number of days. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So it is seven to 10, but it's a 12 hour period within that, uh, yeah. within that, seven to 10. I see. Okay. And they have to move it every every day, but they could still do that every single day. They could put it on the driveway, have the generators running at seven in the morning or or till 10 at night within the 12 hour, as long as the 12 hours period. Theoretically, yes. Okay. Okay, I understand. Thank you. What what time do you want the corn dog truck there tomorrow, Commissioner? <laughs> <I don't. laughs> well, as long you know, as the generator will wake me up in the morning, that's great, because that'd be my alarm clock. <laughs> the Lehigh Bakery has invited a um, coffee truck that sits there every morning. Oh. So that's oh. like another donuts and coffee and hot chocolate. So <laughs> there's a line there every morning. I drive past it every day, and there's a line. <laughs> I think it really works well. Yeah, I'm just worried about the sound. For if you if you live next door, that's that's what I, you know, the line I can live with because they have to follow, uh, you know, traffic standards. But the sound they don't. So that's seven in the morning that the generator is running, or actually even possibly late, earlier. It would still need to comply with the uh, noise ordinance, though. So what are we? Is it's that true? Like our hands forced a little bit. I share some of those similar concerns um, that Commissioner Kilgore short shared. Like we we kind of undercut ourselves, and maybe there is a synergistic approach to this that I don't fully understand, but. Um, I, Mike, did we get any feedback at all? I obviously this was noticed. Did was there any feedback? I uh, I didn't or, receive any public comment on this, and I think you kind of phrased it well. I think the short and skinny of it is there are pros and cons to it. Like I said, it was a it's a double edged sword, and but in a lot of ways, because of the way state code is written, our hands are tied to a certain extent, and in this, it be and Marin have implemented the furthest extent of what we can regulate. So you don't see us making a lot of money off of permits because as long as they, most people are just gonna stay on the property lines of the commercial or residential, right? Right, yeah, exactly. And, and quite honestly, our the money we make on, um, on uh, special event permits is really just processing fees we, we don't really make money off of special event permits it's so like a permit is a it's not a one-time use it's like a seasonal year long or something no no let's clarify so there's there's their business license right um, that they have to have if they have a saratoga springs or another city but yeah the the special event permit um they they can um, if they have reoccurring events, like throughout the summer, we'll allow them to do one special event permit and tell us the dates and times of their event, um, uh, or, the, or they just have to apply for each event. But I really don't foresee food trucks having the need or very frequently needing to um, apply for a special event permit, because if there's any question, after we talk to them, they're usually like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to try and make it all on private property so I don't have to apply for this permit and pay for it. Um, but up until now, we've had to tell them, well, you can't even do that right now. Um, so I, I, just from um, the interactions that I've had with the food truck owners, I, my guess is we're, we're not really going to have very many special event permits that are going to be required. And my last question, David, we're, I assume we're making a special effort that when we do have our own city and public events, we are pulling from within our own city. We're pulling within our own food trucks and our yeah, own. Yeah, I mean, we work with the food truck league because we don't have the staffing, um, the the amount of staff to manage all the food trucks, if that makes sense. And the food truck league, um, you know, gets certain types of food trucks based on what the event is going for. And almost every time, our local food truck vendors are there and requesting to be there. And in fact. There are a few events that we do 
not using the food truck league because we have some local food trucks who don't want to pay the percentage to the league, if that makes sense. So we do hold, host some city events, not through the food truck league, but for the most part, we use the league because right now we just don't have the staff and manpower to manage all the food truck events that we do, if that makes sense. Okay. I want to ask something uh, Commissioner McConkie mentioned, the noise ordinance. Where, where do I find that and how does, how would having a, um, food trucks in the residential area impact the noise ordinance? Is there any conflict or impact? Uh, if, if there's an issue with the noise, uh, we do have Brad Davis who does code enforcement. Uh, and he has gone out on a few other residential uh, sites, not for food trucks, but for some other issues. But we do actively uh, look into those things when, when we do get a complaint. Um, Where is that? Is that in Title 19? The, the it's noise Title 10, I believe. Oh, okay. Dave, I think he's looking to find out what are the parameters and criteria of our current noise ordinance and does it apply to food trucks? I believe it does apply to food trucks. I just don't know off the top of my head, what the yeah, that, that's that's title ten. Yeah, I just saw. It's I just 10. found it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, ten point ten. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was anything about it, um, how it, if it would conflict in any way with, uh, you know, in the residential area, but maybe not. Yeah, yeah I mean, if we get a complaint and they're, they're doing that, then we'd have to tell them you got to, you know, do something to to quiet it up or your generator off, something, but it would be a legitimate complaint that Brad would have to look into. And, and it would be like any other zone or use. So if, if any other zone is, um, regardless of what's allowed, what uses are allowed in that zone, if they're violating the, the noise ordinance, well, that's, that's the violation, not, not the use in the zone, but the, the violation of the noise ordinance. So it, my understanding, and Marin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the noise ordinance would still apply to them um, even within the parameters of what's allowed for the use itself. I, I would concur. But what would take precedence though? So if someone says, you can't have this here because it's noisy, and then the-, and then the it, It's know, not and a matter of- says, I can because I'm allowed to. Yeah, it's not a matter of precedence. It it would be you can have your food truck here, but you need to you need to take care of the the excessive noise that's violating the ordinance. So uh, okay. that that's that's my understanding of how it would be applied. Okay, I'd I'd say that's correct because it's just like a restaurant. If it if they're playing outside music, they have to abide by the noise ordinance and turn it off or turn it down once it gets to that point. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask. First, um, if if I did have a private event and I wanted to have the food truck come by, do I have to pay them directly? I, I you know, hey, come be at my place for two hours, and I don't I don't know that I could pay for twelve hours or something like that. Tippy, do you know? As long as long as they meet these standards, you know, and they're parked entirely on private property on the driveway. Um, in a safe manner, then the city doesn't require anything. And if they're going to charge you for it, then that's between you and the business. So that's not okay. a city matter. Boy, in fact, Just thinking, I, I don't necessarily want it at my house all day long. If I've got to pay so much an hour for that. The, Troy, in fact, if I, were you, yes, go ahead. if I were you and you were doing that, I'm just speaking a little um, uh, uh, sarcastically, I, I would say I want a percentage if you're going to park on my property. <laughs> well, that was, that was I was just going to say, I'll give you a cut in the corn dogs that we're going to sell next to Ken's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, as long as it's at Ken's. I don't, well, know, again, I don't know, my, you know. Because probably. this is state mandated, so I, I'm all, you know, so yeah, I'll vote for it. But I, I do want the impacts and, you know, how it, in various scenarios just to be on the record. That's all. No, and, and I don't mean to jest. I think it's a great discussion. So please don't take it that way, Commissioner. Yeah, that's right. Hey, so I've got a question for Marin. I forgot to open this for public input. Uh, you can open it right now. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and open this for public comment. Any members of the public that are here for comment can go ahead and make comment at this time 
or if we've had any, but I've already know that David Johnson has already mentioned that he didn't receive any public comment. So uh, as if there was no public comment, I'm gonna close this for public comment. What about them before? We have the applicant speak to it. We need to, what do we need to do on the public comment for that item? The city. I'm sorry. The um, zone change for the um, assisted living centers. Yeah, there was no public comment received for that. Okay. So well, if we don't- Technically, you still needed to open it for public comment. <laughs> Okay. So I would suggest when we finish these ones, let's go back, reopen that, have it at public comment period, reclose it, and then you're going to need a new motion and a vote. Okay. That's what I was afraid of. Yeah. All right. Um, so if we are done with the uh, commissioner comments on this item, let's make sure before we make the motion, we have the right codes definitions for this one. I think we have what 192 and 1905 for this one. Is there another one that they need to put in the motion? And I do have a couple questions. Okay, go ahead. If, sure. if that's okay. Um, one question I had is, uh, is there any uh, regulation or, or anything addressing the wastewater from the food trucks? Um, Anything believe, stating that they they uh, have to dispose of their wastewater and waste products? And, there should be. Yeah, that they have to have it. They they cannot be disposing of that. Let me see. Yeah, not like the ones that I see dumping on the street as they're turning around the corner. I remember writing that, so it should be there. <laughs> there was something about it. Yeah, I remember reading it as well. Okay. Okay, I just, I didn't see it, probably just didn't see it. The other question is, do we have, but um, the definition of event permit only applies to public food truck events on public property? Is that correct? Um, it special event permits are required only if a food truck on a private property has public impacts to things such as traffic, you know, traffic, if that makes sense, or if they're sectioning off, or if they're requesting to section off a portion of a, of a neighborhood street or something like that. Right. that require a, a so my question is, is it only based on, I'm looking uh, under definitions, um, it only applies to food trucks and nothing else. N no, it, uh, so that's separate than this. Yeah, this is separate than special event permit, but this comes directly from the state code. So when they refer to, when you refer to event permit in the context of food trucks, then this, uh, this definition applies. Okay. Yeah. So, and I can answer your other one, your other question was storm drain. So in 1905.11, it's subsection A and it's, five let's see it's six and seven food trucks cannot be located within 10 feet from any manhole or storm drain inlet and food trucks shall not discharge or dispose of any substance material food or waste into the storm drain sy system perfect yeah that's what i was looking for and my my last question uh going to 1905 11 1a 2 Food trucks shall be shall park on a hard surface and not on any landscaped area. Um, didn't it also say that? Uh, is it in the same section? Should not park uh, in designated uh, required parking areas. Yes. So every home in the city is required to have two off-street parking spaces. So as long as they still have those re required two off-street parking spaces, then the food truck's allowed to park in the third or the fourth space available. 
Okay, so if they can fit four cars on the driveway, they can park. They just need to leave space for two cars on the driveway. Yeah, so as to not push the parking for the house onto the street. Right, right. Okay. And no parking on the uh, grass. <laughs> yeah, or gravel. Yeah, that's not allowed. That's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other comments on this item? And I, let's make sure. So it's sections 1902 and 1905 when they're making the motion, correct? Yes, those are the only two for food trucks. Okay. So I entertain a motion at this time. Do we? How much Go ahead, Commissioner it, Anderson. How much of it is our choice versus we're supposed to be compliant? I guess that doesn't matter. We can just we like I don't know. Do we? We, we actually did put quite a bit in there to protect mm -hmm. the city and the streets and pedestrian right of ways and and. Um, you know, talking about walled enclosures and canopies. So we we did put it quite a bit in there. And one other thing is uh, part of, I mean, this was something that staff we've been talking about for a while, but uh, more recently the city council specifically requested us to make these amendments to the code, if that makes sense. Sorry, proceed. Someone proceed with the motion. Yes, go ahead. I slaughtered the last one, so. <laughs> okay, let me try it then. Uh, um, I move that, uh, I move to recommend adoption of the amendments to the um, code 19.02 and 19.05 as, um, written in the staff packet. We have a motion, do we have a second on the motion? I'll second it. Okay, so I have a motion from Commissioner Kilgore, a second from Commissioner Anderson, or not Anderson, Commissioner Barton. Do we have a question on the motion? Okay, so we're down through again. Commissioner Kilgore. Uh, aye. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner McConkey. Aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. And Commissioner Wagstaff. Aye. And Commissioner Cunningham. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Go ahead and move on to the bond portion. All right, uh, Tippy, you've got your screen up there. Do you have the, the bond language after that, or I could try and bring it up on mine if it's not going to draw. I've got it. Again. Just tell me when to scroll, I guess. <laughs> okay, and, and Marin will go over this when this came from the legal department to comply with the changes to state law. So, as David said, most of these changes are just in response to state law, and we're updating and as you know, we're constantly trying to keep our city code up to date. So uh, the first one, the 1909.8, we really just streamlined it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to take all of chapter 19 together. If you want to do it in, in a piece, what would you suggest, Troy? So there's more in here than just the bonding? So it's bonding, but they're in different sections throughout chapter 19. Okay. So the first one just deals with landscaping and parking areas. I think we should just do it all as one because uh, all as one motion. Okay. Okay. Because if they're related, let's just do it that way. Yeah, well, then I'll probably just open it up and see if you have questions. That might be easier. Um, Should we, but, why don't we do public comment? Okay. Yeah. And then good. we'll do the, 
So I will go ahead and open this for item for, for public comment. If there's anybody from the public that would like to make comment on this item, go ahead and do that at this time. Um, David Johnson or David Stroud, did either of you receive any emails for public comment on these items? On this I did item? Not. Yeah. Okay. There, there's, I, we've received no public comments uh, thus far for any agenda items tonight. Okay. So we'll go ahead then and I'll close the public comment and we'll turn it over to the commission for questions for Marin to answer about the bonding. I'm open for questions. <laughs> I, I have a question. I'm looking at item four, building and occupancy permits. Yes. It reads, it shall be unlawful for any person to receive a building or occupancy permit to all infrastructure improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I was, my question was gonna be, is there a reason why it, the, the verbiage, so can they, Maybe I just answered my own question. So they cannot receive either is what that's saying. Is that correct? Correct. No building permit. And well, if you can't get a building permit, you can't get a permit to occupy either. Correct. Okay. Aaron, this is, this is Commissioner Ryan. Wondering if you could give us a little better background as to this is typical practice in other areas of infrastructure, right? And I'm just wondering if you have any background on, as to why the inclusion now of uh, these additional items with the, with the bonding measure with landscaping, et cetera, from the state, the reasoning behind it. You know, I think the state is constantly tinkering with their codes every year and you know, I mean, I think they, they made a ch difference between private landscaping and commercial projects. Um, and so I think they were changing, you know, what they were requiring to have done for private uh, development versus a commercial project. So they wanted to make sure that you had to bond for the public improvements for commercial projects um, and that and not require that for a private uh, property. So I think that was one of the big pushing elements on this. You know, like you, you as a homeowner probably shouldn't have to bond to do your landscaping. Thank you. Okay. If there's no other comments, I just want to make sure we know what sections were a motion on. I think it's 1906, 1909, 1912, and 1924. 1924. Did anybody have any questions on that constitutional takings claim? We were just clarifying and redefining what a final decision is uh, to make it easier for everybody involved. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so I'll go ahead and entertain a motion then. I'll make it, you'll just have to help me with the sections. So based upon the evidence and explanations we see today, I move to forward a positive recommendation to the city council for the proposed amendments to sections 19, was it 05? 06. 1906, 1909, 1912, 1924. That is correct. Okay. And 1914. Is 1914 in there as well? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, with the findings and conditions in the staff report dated October 15th, 2020. We have a motion, Commissioner Barton. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Second from Commissioner McConkie. Any question on the motion? Okay, so I'll go ahead and go from the bottom up. 
Commissioner Wagstaff. Aye. Aye. From Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Commissioner Monkey. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Kilgore. Aye. And Commissioner Cunningham, aye. Okay, so we'll hurry through the next thing. Sorry that I messed up, guys. <laughs> On the um, so this is this is the uh, changing the permitted uses. Um, so I'll go ahead and open that up for public comment. If anybody from the public is here to comment on that, they can go ahead and make a comment at this time. And uh, I believe Commissioner, or I mean, Planning Director Stroud and uh, David Johnson, we received no public comment. Is that correct? For that is correct. Okay. So I'll go ahead and close the public comment and then I'll entertain a motion again, sorry. And this is for, for item nine, number yeah 19.04 19.04 who did that one was it me can i repeat my motion is that the one that i made a motion yeah on? yeah that's the negative that was one a long made. time yes. ago <laughs> sorry guys i messed up that's okay yeah. can i just say i repeat my the motion i previously made <laughs> I'll ask Marin that. She's our legal representative. You need to actually state the whole motion. <laughs> reread it for you if that's helpful. Can you reread it, Kayla? Yep. You said um, you moved to forward a recommendation to deny allowing residential facilities for elderly persons and residential facilities for persons with a disability in section 1904. Okay. That is correct. Yeah, that again. <laughs> yeah, I would like so to. What you, you could respond with just so moved. Ooh. So moved. And then a second on that. Second. Okay, Commissioner Mark, start with the second. Any question on the motion? Okay, so we'll go down through the list again. Commissioner Cunningham, aye. Commissioner Kilgore. Aye. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner McConkie. Aye. And Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Commissioner Wagstaff. Aye. Okay, that motion passes. On to the approval of the minutes, I believe now. Did everyone have an opportunity to review the minutes? And if, um, Anyone have changes they need to submit to uh, Kayla? All right, I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes. I move to approve the uh, Planning Commission minutes for the meeting held on October 8th, 2020. I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Kilgore and a second from Commissioner Barton, and uh, we'll, I'll start uh, alphabetically, try to. Commissioner Anderson. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner McConkey. Aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Commissioner Wagstaff. Aye. Commissioner Kilgore. Aye. Commissioner Cunningham, aye. Okay, um, commission comments. Any commissioner comments this evening? I have something. Um, so again, going with the food trucks thing, I, I know that that's, you know, the it's state, more or less, that's the way it's going to go. Um, but sometimes I just wonder if it's just the, uh, some lobby group or something just really uh, influential at, at that time and time and at that time, um, which pushes, you know, people's direction, because like, like uh, the whole bee, bees or, or chickens in your backyard, I mean, I understand why people want to do that. I, I don't have a problem for it per se, but at the same time, you know, the number one cause of uh, um, animal deaths in the United States is bee stings because of all, you know, because people, people have allergies 
And the more bees that we have in the backyard, the more people die. Um, and so there's nobody representing the bee allergy folks, you know, even though, I mean, more people die of bee stings than terrorist attacks in America every year. Um, and so, I mean, on, an, on average. And so it's just, so just because that's the way it's going doesn't necessarily mean that that represents what everybody wants. It's just some lobby group is really, you know, at that moment in time is strong. So that's why, even though I don't think we could really stop it, but I do think that we should at least make the comments, make the impacts, understand the impacts, have it on the record and, and then, and then, you know, and then go, go with the trend. So uh, if, if we have to, so I think, uh, uh, I, I just wanted to make, make that comment because uh, I don't always, even with chickens, the reason why Wuhan, you know, uh, wa the water market or whatever, wet market, and the reason why a lot of diseases come from China is not because the Chinese are inventing them. It's because Chinese live very closely with their birds, you know, the, their ducks, their chickens. And, and in Europe and in America, and when we did, we also had lots of disease, but it's the, the laws that fortunately restricted that, that we don't get them anymore. But now if we're, if we forget that and we start to go with chicken coops all over without getting the proper vaccinations, then yeah, people are gonna start dying from those kinds of diseases that come from birds and stuff. So that's why I just think that we should always be wary of where the trend is going and remember our history and remember why we have those ordinances in place. Um, but anyway, that's just my comment. Thank you, Commissioner Kilgore. Any other comments? I'd, I'd like to make a comment that uh, having worked for several cities, a food truck topic has been uh, very complex and it's been a loaded topic for a long time. And, and uh, if the first city I worked for, we were also part of the, the uh, city code enforcement team, if you will, and didn't quite know how to handle those. And so there has been a great deal of lobbying. I, I don't know all the details, but I, I am speaking from, <clears throat> from a business perspective. Um, you have uh, big box stores that tend to go together, you know, take for example, Lowe's and Home Depot. They generally speaking, prefer to build next to each other. Same thing with furniture stores. You've got, for example, in Draper, you've got kind of a furniture row, if you will, with Ikea and, uh, and the others right there. Um, they tend to feed off each other and, and allow people to congregate. I think that um, as times change and things change, uh, including with the food trucks, um, we have a potential opportunity to really use it to our advantage as a city to benefit the people. Um, and certainly we could say, you know, if we attract more uh, food truck owners to live in Saratoga Springs, then Saratoga Springs could receive the tax benefit for those and they can go out to other cities and, and we receive that. I don't know what, how big the benefit would be. Um, and certainly there's other uh, challenges that go along with that, but certainly we, we can also uh, create an environment where um, we receive benefits of this, this second hand, the second hand benefits, I guess, you know, if, if you bring, certain businesses here, then the residual effect is what brings the financial benefit to the city. Similar to say uh, an office building, you don't, we don't typically see the tax benefit of an office building, but they need a place to eat. And so, you know, during lunchtime, restaurants are full, and now the city's getting a secondary benefit. So I, I think we've got some potential opportunity here as, to, to capture some fringe benefits, if you will. I agree with that. And I, I also like the idea of where, uh, you know, if we're gonna build a kind of a resort uh, amenity that attracts maybe surrounding you know, people from surrounding cities, you know, like a lakefront or a, or, or a riverfront or things like that. Uh, it's the, and then we have our, um, our large parks, you know, and, and Neptune Park and, uh, and, the, and the new big one. And so the food trucks, I think would be really great for that, it have more of a carnival atmosphere, maybe in the summertime, you know, things like that. Um, I just wonder when you start pushing them into the suburb, residential suburbs, you know, if that's still the, the sort of thing that we want. So that's why I think we should weigh, you know, both aspects in resident, in the residential area. 
but yeah, at the same time, you want to have block parties. I totally get that too. So I just think we just, it's good to just discuss all the impacts from both sides. Yeah, and I, and I do know that some of the decisions the state makes affects all the cities and, and the cities are just simply limited right. on how to regulate and, and so there's some positive benefits and certainly some negative benefits and I, and I could really see both in this case. Okay. So if I can just add, because um, we didn't mention it, or I think thoroughly enough earlier was that th this and having it allowed in the residential zones was the specific request from our city council. Um, so that's something that they've they've wanted and they've been hearing from the community. And so that's that's what truly initiated this amendment being made. Again, bees. <laughs> okay, um, director's report. Well, a couple things. Uh, let's see, I'm go back on video here and not get booted. Uh, a couple things. Uh, of course, your next meeting is November 12th. That is the only meeting in November, and you only have one meeting in December as well. Uh, fingers crossed. Hope to have the Crossing Village Plan 3 uh, to you on the 12th. That is the that vacant property just north of Smith's, which will be a large commercial uh, complex. Uh, their plans do actually show some named businesses, what they've submitted. Uh, they show a Chick-fil-A, they show a Chili's, they show a uh, Ross as well, and some other buildings. I can kind of guess, guess what they are, but no name, so I'm not going to say it. But they have indicated those on their plan, so I'm guessing that those will be coming in uh, to that project. Uh, it will be a kind of an anchor building, you know, similar to to what you see with Smiths with the anchor tent, not, not that square footage, but a, a larger anchor tenant with multiple smaller tents off to the side and then uh, smaller pads out front, which typically will probably be uh, restaurant pads, but hopefully that will be coming to you on November 12. Uh, also, <clears throat> Commissioner Kilgore and Commissioner McConkey are both up for reappointment. So I've submitted their names and they've both expressed a desire to stay on the planning commission. So I pass those wishes on to the mayor, who is the, uh, who does the appointing uh, planning commissioners with the will and consent, advice and consent, excuse me, of the city council. So I suspect uh, that will be, uh, be a continuation. I hope so anyway, but uh, you two are the ones that are, are up this year. Of course, Commissioner Kilgore, this would be, if you're reappointed, that will be your second and final term. And then Commissioner McConkey, uh, the way our code is, is you can uh, go two full terms. And, uh, and uh, so that this one that you're doing right now doesn't count towards that. Uh, you are permitted to two, two, two full terms. So you would start your first if the mayor decides to reappoint you. And hopefully he will. But that's up to the mayor and waiting to hear back from him. Okay, thank you, Director Stroud. Um, Next thing is we have to, if we need to go into a possible closed session, I guess we don't, right? So we'll go move on and we'll adjourn this meeting until, no, did, did you say November 12th was the next one? November 12th. Okay. All right, we're gonna stay, we'll remain adjourned until November 12th. Thanks everyone for attending and thanks for your